You send me the this. I'm not seeing it. I don't think so. Okay, let me begin. If everybody's ready, let me pull up the Zoom. Okay, is it ready to record? It's in practice session. Mm -hmm. Okay, ready? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the 1.30 p.m. public portion of the closed session of the October 11th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony and thereafter the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. And if anyone here joining us in person that wishes to speak on closed session agenda, you can line up here to your left. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Here. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkin. Here. And Mayor Bruner. Present. Thank you. If you are attending virtually and would like to speak, you may raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand on the webinar controls of your computer. You will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to three minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. Let's go to attendees. We have participants and nobody with their hands raised and nobody in person. Okay. Hearing none, seeing none, this meeting is now adjourned and council will go into closed session. Members of the public that are attending the meeting virtually Please leave the meeting and rejoin us again at 3.30 p.m. when the regular meeting resumes. Thank you. Okay, is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Can council members turn on your cameras?
Okay, before we begin our regular city council meeting, we need to have the annual meeting of the board of directors of the Industrial Development Authority, IDA, and the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. City council members serve as board members on these boards, which were created for the purpose of providing the city an instrument to issue bonds. Annually, while the bonds are in existence, the board members are legally required to hold a meeting of the IDA and the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. The meetings are procedural and for the purpose of approving minutes and electing new board members. So without further ado, I would like to call to order the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority. I call to order the October 11th, 2022 annual meeting and I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Um. I'm gonna do it as council members for now. Um, council member Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Here. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Meyer. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruno. Present. Thank you. So now I'm looking for a motion to elect new officers as set forth in section 3.02 of the Industrial Development Authority bylaws as follows. Executive Director, City Manager, Matt Huffaker, Chief Financial Officer, Director of Finance, Elizabeth Cable, President, Mayor Brunner, Vice President, Vice Mayor Watkins, and Secretary, Treasurer, City Clerk, Administrator, Bonnie Bush. Is there a motion? So moved. Council Member Golder, is there a second? Second. Council Member Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Okay, that motion passes unanimously with seven yeses. And now agenda item number five, the minutes of last year's October 12th, 2021 Industrial Development Authority. Are there? Um, I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay. I'll second. I'll We have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Golder for the minutes of the October 12th, 2021 Industrial Development Authority meeting. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? I don't see any in person. I will look to my attendees here virtually. You can raise your hand by pressing star nine. I'm not seeing any hands raised virtually. Okay, I will come back uh, for a vote on the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, that motion passes unanimously. And now the meeting of the uh, Industrial Development Authority is adjourned. Thank you. At this time, I will call to order the October 11th, 2022 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation 
And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Um, Director <coughs> Kalantari Johnson? Present. Holder? Here. Coming? Here. Brown? Here. Myers? Present. Watkins? Here. And Bruner? Present. Thank you. I am uh, now looking for a motion to elect new officers as set forth in section 3.02 of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation bylaws as follows, Executive Director, City Manager, Matt Huffaker, Chief Financial Officer, Director of Finance, Elizabeth Cable. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Cabell? It's Cabal. Cabal, thank you. Uh, President Mayor Brenner, Vice President, Vice Mayor Watkins, and Secretary Treasurer, City Clerk, Administer, Administrator Bonnie Bush. I am now looking for a motion from a director. We have Director Watkins. Second. And a second by Director Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the general business, the minutes of the October 12, 2021 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? <coughs> I will look to my virtual attendees. And if you'd like to speak to this item, you can press star nine to raise your hand. If you're joining us in person. Okay, seeing none. I will bring it back. I'm looking for a motion on item number seven, the minutes of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. I'll move the item. Okay. I have a motion by Director Myers. I'll second. And a second by Director Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes unanimously. The meeting of the public Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation is now adjourned. Good afternoon. Now we begin our 3 39, 3.40 p.m. session of the October 11th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. <coughs> and I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Present. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here and Mayor Bruno. Present, thank you. We'd like to begin today's meeting with a couple of presentations. The first one being Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship Summer Youth Trail Crew Accomplishments. And I'd like to welcome Emma Usat, Trails Program Manager of Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship. Hi, everybody. First, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your service for the city of Santa Cruz. And also, thanks for giving me the time to chat today. Um, I did just want to check in real quick. I can't tell from my end. Are you viewing my presentation right now? Is it being displayed by Bonnie by any chance? No. Um, okay. Oh, I see but it's going here out. Here it is. Great. Now Now we this see it. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yes. Um, as many of you are familiar, Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship, SCMTS, has been partnering with the City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department for the last five years to put together a summer youth trail crew. So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, it's kind of hard to, 
write a description that's really easy about what it is. So the Summer Youth Trail Crew, we call it SYTC, that's our acronym. It's an eight-week paid position where six high school-aged crew members um, get to work on a crew together, basically just for the summer break, to perform trail maintenance um, in city open spaces. And I just put this little disclaimer. This is from the city's uh, job description. Uh, yeah, it's it's aimed at high school students, so high school students only may apply. So it's for for the youth. Um, and these are our. This was our crew this year. We had four members, um, and I'll get to that later. There were a few things that were challenges this year, but one was actually an overall challenge for all the city parks department city jobs for the summer was getting enough uh, people to join these temporary jobs. It wasn't just for this job. It was for a lot. And we did a ton of outreach, but for some reason it was kind of hard to fill this role for the summer. I think just COVID stuff, but anyway, we keep going. Um, yeah, these are the four crew members. They were super awesome. Quinn is a returning crew member and we've had that happen a few times in the program. And uh, I think that really says a lot about how much fun they're having. <laughs> so we can continue on. And this is Travis. He was the Summer Youth Trail Crew lead. And so he's been a volunteer for the last almost decade at SCMTS. And he went to trail bowling school. He owns a business over the hill, or he did. And he's just a really great volunteer. He's one of our top volunteers. So having him lead the crew was, we were super fortunate. And the crew had a great time. He has a lot of great quotes, um, and I have all this and more of an official report that I can share with like the debrief notes and everything after this meeting, but for this purpose of this meeting, I just kind of wanted to share some of the highlights. So yeah, Travis was the crew lead, and he actually is full-time with our organization now as an account manager. So we want to keep going. Just to give a basic overview of the projects, I actually put together uh, the first schedule this year, and then it, we ran it by Blake, and um, who is works with the city and got everything approved. And I was really, really happy for the crew this year because they got to work in so many parks. I can I can't even think of other parks that they could have worked on um, that are city parks with trails. So it was really cool. They performed a lot of trail maintenance and cleanup. So like picking up garbage, just generally looking at the whole trail corridor and seeing what needed to be improved. Um, they brushed and removed a lot of invasive plants. Um, when we get to it in a minute, you'll hear that they removed 4,000 pounds of weeds. Um, they fixed a lot of signage and did a lot of fence installation and repair. They did get to help out with a new trail construction project at Sycamore Grove, which they later all said was their favorite part of the whole experience because they got to work alongside our trail crew. And they also ended the whole entire eight weeks at the West Side Pump Track, um, fixing a few asphalt marks and painting. And um, of course they got to have an ice cream party the last day. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> listed some of the trails and parks that they worked in. Um, De La Viega, which we're actually going to tomorrow to lead 100 kids to do invasive plant removal, a bunch of pogonit trails, so the McCrary, Lookout, Fern, uh, Moore Creek, Royal Seco, basically anywhere that you can think of that is trail and city park, they were there. <laughs> so we can continue. Oh yeah, I just included a few before and after, so you can kind of just get the, the general gist of the amount of work that they did. This is a before picture. This is at Moore Creek. If you want to go to the next one, it's pretty much impassable. Wow. And afterwards, you can see where the 4,000 pounds of weed comes from. And I just want to highlight that, you know, we as an org and this crew really look at the whole trail. So it's not just uh, tr the tread, the actual trail. We're working on, you know, brushing, like I said, graffiti removal from bridges, the whole experience for the trail user. So keep going. And just kind of skip through these. This is a before. I want to highlight the sign here. A lot of signs are were unreadable. And then if you go to the next, um, the crew spent a lot of time cleaning up interpretive signs and installing missing signs. And we have a whole list of the unfinished business that we'll be able to accomplish at a later time. Keep going here. And thanks, Bonnie. And yeah, just a few pictures of what their experience was like. Um, and we can move on. Yeah, so to wrap it up with a little bit of stats, um, 
We spent 40 days all together, 1,600 hours in city open spaces. Um, 355 of those hours were kind of our time, like me putting together the schedule. But I just want to say that doesn't count city staff time. And city staff is one of the highlights that we'll get to in a bit. Mm -hmm. um, they worked in, on 22 trails, parks and pump tracks. Like I said, 4,000 weeds, which we have tags where we weighed the weeds so we know. My favorite part of the entire program is that Jaden and Quinn, pictured here, became best friends, and they go fishing together all the time now, mm -hmm. and it was really cute. Jaden lives in Watsonville. Quinn lives in uh, Boulder Creek. And, yes, they had endless memories and life skills acquired, as Travis said. So if you want to keep going, another picture. We can keep going. Um, I'm not going to read through all these, but we have a lot of what went well from our official debrief that we can share. And But the one thing I did want to highlight is that um, the city acquired through a grant a tool trailer and tools, which was incredible. And now we're like, wow, we need to do that too, because it was just so helpful to have a library to choose from. And it also just helped us do more work. Um, this was definitely the most work we've ever done, even with a four-person crew as opposed to a six-person crew. And then also Blake, Travis, Tony, all the, the city park staff are just the best. Like I work with all the land agencies. I work with people from all over the state and the country. They are so responsive, so professional, so fun and easy to work with. And it really makes a mark, I think, on this community. It really drives projects forwards and helps amazing programs like this happen. So I just wanted to give the city a huge shout out. Um, but we can keep going. Don't have to read through all these. Let's get to the next slide, which is improvements, I believe. If you challenges, yeah. So like I said, it was challenging in general. I've heard from every labor force to fill for youth this summer. I'm not sure why. Um, but the, uh, the other, I guess, things here would be just a few internal things. Um, nothing, nothing too crazy to share here, actually. I think it's the next slide, actually, that had a few things I wanted to share. Oh, yeah. So definitely something that's really important to me and was important, and I tried really hard, but it just didn't happen, was, you know, making sure our, our crew is dive like a diverse group of people. And the prior year we had three women, um, which was really great. And it, 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 yeah, it was just awesome to have an equal number of people on the crew. Um, so really making sure that that happens again next year. Um, <laughs> I, I did not put let the, youth, let the youth use power tools, but I can see why that was added uh, just because mm -hmm. A lot of the time, Travis, the crew lead, would be using the power weed whacker on French room and other stuff, and then the crew would just follow, and it would be, they'd be able, able to do that much more if the crew could be trained to how to use power tools. And it would also just be a cool educational opportunity. And, yeah, a few other things here, but, again, I can share this after. So if we want to keep going. Um, this is the last piece I just wanted to share. So as you all may be familiar, how it kind of works is that we, the city pays for the cruise staff time, which is not list, listed here. So obviously that's a huge lift. And then also um, half of our crew leads staff time, which we pay more than we, we end up supplementing. So anyway, the general point is this is about how much rough estimate we invested, not counting things like, you know, swag or ice cream parties or other other random things that we threw in. But that's just a little snippet of about how much we're investing each year on this program. Um, and then if you want to continue, yes, like I said, we just want to thank you all for helping make this possible. And I'll just end with um, the last slide is this next one. It's nothing really, but... <laughs> I just want to end with, um, you know, my vision is that this program's incredible. I really see it changing lives. Honestly, I, I worked closely with, I went and visited them every week and brought them pastries. Travis paid for them to have lunches from his own pocket every Friday. Like, we love this crew. I'm just seeing the, the friendships and also the careers. Like, 
three of the the people on the crew were like, I really want to work for the city next, or I, I'm really interested in working outdoors now or natural resource management. I just think the potential is huge for a program like this. And my dream would be to have simultaneously um, work with the city of Watsonville and I don't know, the city of Scotts Valley and have like a crew in the city of Santa Cruz, a crew in South County and a crew in the Santa Cruz mountains going at the same time. So that's kind of how I envision this. And I just, yeah, wanted to say thank you so much. So if you want to go to the last slide, it has my contact. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emma. Congratulations to the program being so successful. And thank you for sharing those efforts and photos. It's pretty amazing and it's greatly appreciated. Yay. I would like to just um, give council members an opportunity for comments or questions. Uh, council member Cummings and then council member Kalantari Johnson. First off, thanks for that wonderful presentation and it's great to see all the good work that um, you know you all are doing it with your group and then how you're inspiring the youth to be good stewards of our environment um, I had a question but you actually answered it um, in part at the end which was kind of like what's happening in terms of is there any connection with the young people in the city in terms of like pipelines for kids getting mm -hmm. jobs in the future and um, I guess the comment I'll make is just that you know it would be great if we could kind of track that and see like you know if there are young people who come through these programs um, like do they get jobs in the city and where does it kind of lead them into the future but yeah just really good to see how this is having a positive impact on the lives of young people in the community so thanks for all your work and looking forward to see more thank, thank you. you and yeah that's really important to me too um, as a program director you know I really don't want people to come to one event or do one program and then never never see what happens and so that really gets me my mind spinning and I'm gonna look into that um, I'm gonna follow up and see whatever happened because I know pre previous uh, classes of this program they also were very interested in working for the city so I will get back to you on that Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for, for the presentation and the work. Um, I can't stop smiling seeing those faces on our screen. Um, I have a few questions. Maybe I'll just ask them all at once. Uh, can you remind us the, the capacity for the program? I know you had four youth this summer. Maybe you said that a night and I missed it. And then what, are, um, what strategies are you using for outreach so that we can think about how to augment that in yeah. the future? And I had sort of similar thoughts as Councilmember Cummings. Uh, uh, what a great workforce development opportunity this is. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of question and comment, but um, is, is fire prevention and fire mitigation incorporated mm -hmm. into the teachings as you do the uh, trail stewardship? And if not, that there's a great opportunity there. Thanks for all the work. Yay, thanks for all those great questions. Um, the first one, capacity building. Okay, so yes, four people. I actually don't know as much about, it's the city's budget that really determines, um, like, we're, I know we could have hired up to six. Um, I think that we, I think the program cost the city, I'm, I don't want to quote wrong, but I feel like it was around $35,000 um, for, for the city. And so to build it, what I, like, as a person looking at, our mission is to build and maintain all the trails in Santa Cruz County. So my dream would be to team up with the city of Santa Cruz to get a grant to, like, expand the program and also, yeah, and have the mission be a workforce development program of some kind or, like, educational. And so I, I feel like right now it's, it's an incredible experience and they're learning a lot hands-on, but as you may have saw in the challenges or improvements uh, more educational opportunities we, we try to fold that in like i teach the crew trail academy classes and but i think we could really we could add more we could add wilderness first aid we could add chainsaw training we could add a lot of other useful tools that then they have with them to go and apply for jobs um and we do send them a list personally of like all these job boards and resources and we personally offer to help them with their resumes 
but I would love to make it more official and keep growing it because it's so awesome. And I just really don't want it to disappear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you so much, Emma, for joining us. And did you have a question? We do have another question here in person. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not here for this item, but I'm fascinated by it. Rosemary Menard, the water director. I did want to let Emma know, and the council members also, we're having a trades day event at the Civic Auditorium on the 15th of November. Ooh. And um, it's uh, 830 to 1230. Uh, Emmett, if you want to get a hold of me, um, I can give you the name where you can sign up for a booth. Um, we've got yeah. a bunch of different kinds of uh, groups coming. Can you talk uh, in the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. That's there you go. There we go. Uh, lots of different kinds of groups coming. And uh, it's about right now around 450 high school kids, kids from all over the county are signed up to come. Um, so it's we're working on getting folks. It's free to participate. If you'd like to get a booth and think about talking about what you do, um, it's great. We'll be targeted just to the exact uh, demographic you're looking for. Uh, I know the city is having uh, water and wastewater and refuse are having um, booths. There's a lot of interactive activities that are planned. There's going to be big equipment in the um, civic parking lot that people can do hands-on things with. So more information will be coming on this, but it's a trades day activity we're doing in combination with Your Future is Our Business, which is one of our partners in our workforce, de workforce development initiative we've been working on. Also, um, uh, the, the Construction Industry F Education Foundation is uh, another partner. So um, the city is providing the sponsorship for the participation of the Civic, and Water Department is going to pay the bill for the Civic um, staff to participate. So it's uh, really a great opportunity, I think, to reach out for trades, construction, uh, trades, skilled trades, and green economy jobs, um, and get that information out to our community That's and to sold. future workforce. Rosemary, I'm sorry if I may. Is November 15th at what time? It's going to be 8.30 to 12.30 at the Civic Auditorium, um, and I can send you all a, a flyer about it. Um, but fundamentally, it's we're working on getting it organized right now, and I'm pretty excited. It's a great opportunity to talk about what we do, but also bring other businesses and interests in to talk about what they do in this particular area. Thank you. What was your email? Um, you know what? Um, it's rmenard at cityofsantacruz.com. R-M-E-N-A-R-D. Okay, now everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, before I go real quick, sorry, I forgot to answer the question about outreach. Um, I uh, run our DEI committee, and I also um, partner really closely with the city of Watsonville, and I was really trying to make sure we had equal representation from all parts of the city um, and the county, and we... We did actually. So we had, yeah, a kid from the west side, a kid from, uh, like I said, Boulder Creek. We did have one kid from Watsonville, and the last kid was from Midtown. So yeah, we did have good representation, I guess. But um, it was really challenging uh, to get. So yeah, basically, I have a huge outreach list. Sent it to a, all the schools repeatedly, all the teams, um, all of our agency partners. I made a poster, I put flyers, and I did table at uh, an event held by the city. However, I think next year, what I've already been doing is I, I just did a presentation at PCS, and I'm going to table at schools during lunchtime, um, like a month before hiring to try to recruit more people. That is all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Emma. Okay, bye. Have a good day. Okay, our next presentation, agenda item number nine on today's agenda is a pure, pure Water SoCal project update, SoCal Creek Water District. And I'd like to welcome Melanie Mao Schumacher with SoCal Creek Water District. Hi, hi Melanie. Hi, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and fellow council members. My name is Melanie Mao Schumacher. I'm the Special Projects Communications Manager here at Soquel Creek Water District. I'm also overseeing the Pure Water Soquel program. Um, today, we're just really grateful to have the opportunity to be before the council to do a quick short presentation 
on the film that has been released last month on Pure Water Soquel. Um, we're pretty excited about it and we're really just trying to do a little bit of outreach to organizations and present the movie at their meetings. Um, unfortunately, Ron Duncan, my general manager was here, but we had a conflicting meeting that started at four. So he also wanted to just share his um, gratitude in the partnership over the years with the city of Santa Cruz. This project is um, not just Soquel Creek Water District's projects. It's, it's in large part, we could not have done what we've been doing with this project um, without the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, with the agreements, with the partnerships, um, from elected officials down to staff. We we're really gonna miss um, Mark Dettel, who's the public works director, who's retiring his staff, um, and Rosemary staff have been instrumental in the development of this project. So um, we have about a five minute video, and what I wanted to share with you is just a couple of slides and then the, then the film. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank okay, you. great, thank you. So as I mentioned, um, the, this is a film uh, on Pure Water Soquel that's part of a larger online series put out by the International Water Association. And all of these films are produced and made by BBC Storyworks. Um, the films were a part of a series called Beneath the Surface and was tied to the launch of their International Water Conference in Copenhagen. The films really feature and highlight innovation and innovators specifically working on water sustainability projects. So um, the films in themselves, there's 17 films that focus and highlight 16 different projects. And of course, geographically located all throughout the world. This is just a list of where the projects um, are coming from. And specifically um, of this suite, there were two that were uh, from the United States, one from California, Santa Cruz County, the Pure Water Soquel Project, and another project from Omaha, Nebraska. All of the films are located online. Um, this is the location from the BBC Storyworks website that illustrates and shows you know, a little featurette of all of the films. Um, Pure Water Soquel was the first of the 17 films that were produced and showcased. Um, and so, as you can see, if you go on that website, we're just in that top right, top left corner. We, we did the filming in March um, and the film is about five minutes long. Um, we have, in addition to myself, who um, was a representative of the community as the Pure Water Soquel Program Director, also as a resident and customer here. Uh, we also had Cindy Wallace-Lage, who's the sustainability lead at Black & Beach. Black & Beach is the design builder who is building the Pure Water Soquel treatment facilities. And we also had Bridget Hoover, who works at the National Monterey Marine Sanctuary. Um, the film was released um, September 8th at the conference, and then each day um, one film will have like an international launch date. Our date was originally supposed to be on September 19th, um, but with since these are all produced by BBC Storyworks, it was um, delayed by a couple of days because of the Queen's passing. So September 22nd was our official launch date, and we've been able to um, show and promote the film. So with that, I'm going to share the link. I think I need to stop really quick just so that I can share again with sound. And here you go. We're just seeing your... Um... I think water is so critical. Am I not sharing the right screen? You got to, yeah, you got to expand the um, enabling seeing, community. Yeah. Now it's up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. I think water is so critical and important, and it has such a nexus to enabling a community to thrive. 
And for us, we have a water scarcity here. We had a water challenge that our only source of water was gonna be contaminated with seawater, which basically means you can't drink it. We rely on rainfall to refill our groundwater basin. And our community are rock stars at water conservation, but even that conservation hasn't proven to be enough. As water is extracted and there's not enough water to be replenished by rainfall, that's what created the kind of critical overdraft of the groundwater basin and caused seawater contamination and intrusion at the coastline. Developing a water supply project is a marathon. It's not a sprint. There's so many things that that need to take place over a long period of time. Getting people to understand the problem and then understanding the technical aspects of it and the science and the data and then tying that to the community values, that's what narrowed us to recycled water. And I think that's why we've been able to go in about seven years from kind of planning a project to actually constructing the project. I think that people are learning about the critical foundational role that water plays in communities. When you, when you go through a city, you don't see the water infrastructure. You don't see the pipelines. You don't see the treatment plants. You don't see all of the intricacies of what it takes to be able to deliver water to the tap and to take wastewater away. And so we have spent a tremendous amount of time educating, showcasing the role that recycled water can play and should play and must play within our communities to be able to have a secure water future. The sanctuary is uh, one of the largest marine protected areas in the nation. It was designated by Congress for the purposes of resource protection, research, and education. Water is a really big part of people's lives here. It brings people to the area to appreciate the ocean and the beauty that we have here, but it also provides a lot of recreational activities as well, whether it's surfing. We're internationally renowned for our diving and all of the organisms that you see when you go out into the ocean. We're lucky here in California, especially on the Central Coast, that there is a, an ethic of environmental protection. Many people ask, what does advanced purification mean? It's important to think that we're beginning with the source water that's already been treated. Now we're going to take that water and we're gonna provide six additional treatment steps to it to get it to drinking water standards. As a community, as a globe, we tend to be really quick to label the drop by its history. Oh, that's wastewater. Oh, it's stormwater. Is it potable water? Is it groundwater? And my perspective is we need to look at this holistically and make sure that we're making the best decisions for every drop of water in our community. And with that challenge, we now have to look at how do we manage water differently. When we think about that secure water future, it is also understanding the impacts of climate change and what is happening around the globe. And recycled water plays a great role because it allows us to now decouple climate from water supply. And so we really saw this as an asset that we could take that water, which has already been treated, and then further treat it through advanced water purification and then put that back into the groundwater basin. So it was able to replenish the basin. It was able to create this freshwater seawater barrier and create that front line of defense to protect our groundwater supply. And it's the collaboration across the community because no one alone can solve the challenge by themselves, but together, <laughs> communities can provide a sustainable water infrastructure. It's an asset that we need to protect, that we need to replenish. And this project isn't just about supporting a community, it's about environmental stewardship. To be able to create sustainability, resiliency, and reliability for my children, for my friends, for my community, I want to help create that sustainability.
that's the film. Um, I hope you de- definitely de- have like a flair for like BBC Storyworks type of filming. It really, what they call it, is kind of more of a human centric. It doesn't have a lot of the the technical part. We do have a very robust website with more project information for people who are interested. Um, as you guys probably know, we've been in construction since 2021. Um, a lot of us, you know, took took hobbies and kind of built our creative side during the pandemic. We did that on the, on a personal side, but from professionally, it was you know getting this project um, through design and into construction. Um, active construction underway at the wastewater treatment plant at the Shannon Clear site where we're building the purification center. The eight miles of pipeline that are going through county and city streets. Thank you. Again, thank you. We know that that is uh, definitely an inconvenience to your residents. And then the three seawater intrusion prevention wells. We are um, planning on having the project online um, in 2024. And we are starting to explore and look into um, developing some tours uh, during the construction of the water purification facility. Um, right off the freeway. So we'll, we'll keep um, people posted on that if they're interested in, in doing a site tour. And but I'm here for questions, um, but I know you also have a lot on your plate. So I just appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, thank you for sharing that movie. There's some great shots in there as well. Uh, do council members have comments or questions? Council member Golder? I just have a quick comment. I want to say thank you. I really love how, and I, I, want, I look at those things on BBC. It's something I actually like to do. So I appreciate now that I can point community members there because the, one of the two complaints I get is um, around water. It's a concern, I guess. And the complaint I get is around the traffic and I'm uh, with, with the construction and I'm constantly trying to explain uh, why the roads are under construction with this project. And it's a, it, that's a, it's a great, resource that I can point out now moving forward. It was beautiful, beautifully done. Thank you. And thanks for all your work. And, uh, Thank you for taking those complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Council member Myers. Hi, Melanie. I just, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and also similarly, just keeping the information flowing about, you know, what's happening, why our streets are being, you know, torn up and the kinds of things that people are seeing. Um, your communication has been really helpful and excellent. And um, like you, I also want to just recognize our city departments that have participated in this because it's um, really a, a it, being in the water world professionally. This is a project that people are looking at literally around the world and certainly is very, very well regarded in California. So it's just exciting to have a little city like ours um, and our partner at SoCal Creek Water District doing really cutting edge work. So. Congrats. Thank you. I think we've always gone into this project as it being a regional project with the collaboration. And I get, I must get goosebumps when I think now the project is available to show to the world that, you know, like the, our, our partnership and the collaboration. And it's not just, it's not just SoCal Creek Water District's project, it's not SoCal Creek and, and the city and the county, it's now California's project and the United, one of the United States projects on that global scale. So I, I hope that you guys feel that as, as well as we do, um, as this um, opportunity with this film has, has shown us. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other council members okay? Thank you so much, Melanie, for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Uh, we will now continue with our agenda today. And I have a few announcements. And then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of chambers. For the consideration of our community, 
Please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually with us, you can call in at the beginning of the item you are wishing to comment on using the instructions on your screen. And remember to mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in the streaming and the sound, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your cue to speak. When it is time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. Public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. So the items today that will be open for public comment are numbers 12 through 20 and 22 through 23 on our agenda. Before moving on to our regular agenda, I'd also like to briefly announce in raising awareness for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women is planning a three-day event next week, and it's completely free for the community to attend. There will be a premiere screening uh, movie. Uh, I think it's called My Name is Andrea, and that will be on Tuesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. at Landmarks Del Mar Theater. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and it's listed here on the screen. Um, we also have a rally sign making on Wednesday, October 19th at 3 p.m. at the Museum of Art and History. This is all uh, events that the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women have organized and then a March for Women's Rights on Thursday, October 20th at 6.30 p.m. at the Santa Cruz County Courthouse. So uh, the in, uh, information is listed on the city website, cityofsantacruz.com slash city calendar. And in honor of uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I did issue a mayor's proclamation proclaiming the month of October 2022 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz. And I encourage all members of our community to participate in the activities during the month of October to raise awareness and work together to prevent violence in our world. Moving on, I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. Um, with the exception of 21, there are none. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the city council met in closed session to discuss the following items. Item one was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims. Those are the claims of a Zoran Sika, um, forgive the pronunciation, and the claim of the Santa Cruz Elks Lodge, number 824. Those are also listed as item 20 on your uh, afternoon agenda. Item two was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning existing litigation. Uh, the litigation entitled Alicia Lopez versus Mary McCoy, currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. <coughs> And in that item, the council, by a unanimous vote, authorized the city attorney's office to file a writ of appeal in the 6th Appellate District, challenging the Superior Court's recent decision, denying a motion for summary judgment that the city uh, attorney's office filed in that case. Item three was a conference with, with labor negotiators uh, involving SEIU temporary employees, SEIU service employees, 
Supervisors OE3. Uh, the council deferred discussion of that item until later this afternoon or evening. And that concludes my report. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call on Laura Schmidt, Assistant City Manager, for a report on updates. Thank you, Mayor. Bonnie, if I can get your help. So while those slides are loading, I'll be giving you my first update on the San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Park restoration and bench lens closures. Right now there is, go ahead and go to the next slide please. Right now there is a citywide team um, making Herculean efforts to restore the bench lands and there have been, they have completed five zones, zones one through four and zone nine. And then um, zone four that closed on October 5th is closed. However, they are continuing to uh, clean it up. You can go to the next slide. Today, they noticed closure of zone 5A and then are, they closed zone 5A and they noticed zone 5B for closure and that will close one week from today on the 18th. We do understand that with the closure of the bench lands that um, other neighborhoods are feeling impacts as far as some campers get picked up by relatives, some campers move on to other locations um, outside of our area, and some campers move to our other parts of our city as well as into other zones in the bench lands that are not closed. The team is working as quickly and as much as possible to address the other impacts that are being raised. Um, we hear the neighbors, we hear you council members, and um, they are really making an effort. But as you'll see in the next couple of slides, um, the work that they are doing is enormous. Bonnie, if you can go to the next slide. This is an example of a zone before the cleanup. So the picture on your left is zone four before cleanup and the picture on the right is zone three after cleanup. You guys will have received an update um, on the 7th that about 171 tons of trash had been picked up to date. We just got an update from the team today, and as of yesterday, that number had changed to 203 tons. And because I like to put things in terms that people can understand, 203 tons is equivalent to 138 Toyota Priuses, or Prii, depending on how you say the plural. If you put 138 Priuses end to end, that goes from City Hall to the London Nelson Community Center. That's how much trash has been picked up. And you can imagine the size of a Prius as well. So it's very substantial and uh, quite arduous, the work that the team is doing. As far as the next slide shows you the aerial view of the cleanup. So the five zones that have been cleaned up are outlined in red, and then the rest of the bench lands are what remains to be done. The other item that we're reporting on is um, a next step in our Water Street Bridge Remembrance. So. In 1877, there was a lynching at the Water Street Bridge, a terrible moment in our community's history. The mayor is forming an ad hoc committee based upon previous direction from council, and that will be comprised of local historians. And then over the next three months, those historians will help, help us look at the historic record, engage the stakeholders, and return to council with a recommendation as far as how to commemorate this event. Um, interested community members be on the lookout. We'll do postings to our intra internet um, on how to contribute and participate in this process. And then the mayor is, has also already reached out, I believe, to some of our local historians to begin to form that ad hoc committee. Our fire department has been working in concert with the police department and Parks and Rec as you heard, I believe in the last meeting from Chief Odie, they have been doing a lot to receive grants for wildfire resilience, a very needed effort in our community, especially with how dry things have been over the last few seasons. And um, the outreach and education, they're doing some specifically in open spaces. 
most recently on the 4th, they did one in Moore Creek or on a gulch in Lower De La Viega. And there's a third round in the next two weeks that will be in po the Poconip area. Additionally, they have some events. One just happened on October the 9th, but there is one coming up on October the 18th. It's a community town hall and we'll do some training and education on open space, wildfire preparedness and evacuation plans and drills. And that will be at 6 to 7.30 p.m. at De La Viega Elementary. As far as the farmer's market update, the board met yesterday and our economic development and housing department have been working quite a bit with the farmer's market. And I know um, Vice Mayor Watkins sits on that board as well, so she can help with this update. But the farmer's market has affirmed their partnership with the city and they will be doing a joint statement and release to that effect shortly. An additional um, commitment that's been made is that the farmer's market will may, uh, remain downtown. So there are multiple viable sites that have been in discussion, and those are temporary and permanent sites. And then a memorandum of understanding, a final draft is currently in process between the board and the city. Upcoming affordable housing projects. There's a lot of great information that planning and community development and economic development and housing put on our internet. So the photo that you see on the right is the Cedar Street family apartments, but all of those affordable housing projects can be found out on our website. And additionally, I think I lost some text. If you go to the next page, if you type in our website, housing assistance information, it will bring you to this consolidated page. So not only can you learn about the affordable housing projects, but you can learn how to get into the assistance pipeline to be able to get on the list for those affordable housing projects as they come online. So a lot of great information that EDH has consolidated into one place. And I think that is the end of our update. Wonderful, thank you. I'm Welcome. really happy to hear that the um, the website was updated with the information for the housing lists and, and connection for folks that are, it's probably the number one question. How do, how do I find out? Uh, when will they be available? How do I apply? Uh, I will open it up for council members for any questions uh, and council member Cummings and then council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for those updates. Um, the only thing I just wanted to, I didn't have any questions, I just had a comment, which was for the, on the Water Street Bridge item. Um, I do know that there's a number of students on campus and so who are interested in this item and kind of brought this to our attention. So i um, happy to put them in contact if they haven't been in contact already. And they would just recommend um, that as the group takes a look at that item that they refer back to the minutes and the gender reports that were generated on this item. But I know there was some discussion that was had around this topic in terms of what that plaque would be and how it would come forward and um, kind of the message that it would be sending to the broader community. And so um, given that council had a lot of discussion around that, just encouraging that those are used as reference materials when kind of diving into the subject. Absolutely, we will. Can I comment on that briefly? Uh, thank you. And um, I know that City Clerk has been very helpful in pulling all of that information since it was before I was on council. So that's all been very helpful. And um, any anybody interested, please reach out to me. I do have confirmation from one UCSC student so far. Um, so I have three confirmations so far in total. Um, so thank you for because you were, you were mayor at the time. No, Martine, Martine, Martine Watkins. Watkins. Okay. I, I believe that I was one of the council members that brought this item forward. Okay. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the thorough updates. I just wanted to um, let everyone know that the town hall, the fire prevention town hall, time has been moved to 6:30 p.m. to 8. Thank you. We'll get that updated so it's in the PDF as well. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the updates. I, um, I, I'm hoping you can, we can hear a little bit more about the efforts to uh, 
um, address the um, consequences of the Benchlands closure, um, because uh, you mentioned it, and so I know everybody's well aware that um, you know people as they are moved out, as they're displaced, are finding other places to be, and we're seeing um, you know trash pile up, and there aren't uh, you know services available and I mean this is something that obviously I know we're all concerned about I've been harping on it for a long time you know what like what I see now is like we're gonna just be chasing piles of trash around um, and doing these cleanups and, and they cost a lot of money and um, you know and I've been a big advocate for early interventions on these and trying to get um, the resources needed to do waste management on a regular basis um, I recognize there are real challenges with that um, but I worry that as we, um, you know, that we're kind of continuing to do what we've been doing for a long, long time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, and with an investment of a significantly more resources. So um, I guess I would just would like to hear about what that means. We're trying, you know, we're, we're on it, we're thinking about it. Like what, and, and also we have a, a public works um, and, and parks crews that are, you know, so overextended. Um, what are like? What is what? Are, what does that mean? We're gonna be addressing it. Just a little bit more on that would be helpful. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, I'll do a few introductory remarks, and then um, our Deputy City Manager for Homelessness Response, Lisa Murphy, is also on the line. As you know, that we have a, a broader three-year homelessness response plan, and the restoration of San Lorenzo and the Benchlands is one component of it. The team is working as quickly as possible on all those components, and even the work that they are doing in San Lorenzo and the Benchlands has a strong component of outreach and trying to fundamentally help the homelessness folks that are in residence in our city. So there are a lot of um, cleanup efforts that are happening, but there are also a lot of strategic longer term efforts and conversations that are happening with the county. And we are doing our best on all of those fronts, but uh, we do have limited resources. And as you said, the, the teams are pretty exhausted right now. So um, it's it's still an all hands on deck and we're, we're doing as much as possible. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lisa Murphy that can give us some more context. And as you know, your next quarterly update on the broader plan will be coming to you in December, I believe. Lisa? Yeah, thank you, Laura. That was a great introduction. Thank you for the questions. Uh, while all of our attention has certainly been focused every day down at the bench stands and the closure, I mean, the real boots on the ground is trying to provide those individuals with the housing that and shelter as they want it and connecting them with services. So we have our outreach workers every day, but not everybody wants to accept that shelter and that offer of services. And you, you know it and you see it, you're seeing it in your neighborhoods, and I'm cer certain you're hearing it from your constituents, that they are moving into other open spaces. And how do we address that? That, that is a, a, a real question. And our resources, because once a, a camp gets entrenched, then the cleanup effort, right, is overly expensive. And it's we don't want to rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. And so having those spaces available to offer shelter, at least for in the, in the short term, as some of these longer term projects come on board, uh, that's really important. But we are trying to make every effort to prevent the entrenchment that is happening in the certain areas. But right now, as we're focusing on bench lands and the limited shelter spaces available makes that difficult, as you know, to try to relocate people from um, other open spaces. But we do have, I really want to encourage the community, we have an encampment assessment team. We meet twice weekly. And we, as complaints come through the CRISP portal that's online, we track each and every one and make efforts to address each one. But not all are, are um, able to clear out. That's that's the bottom line because we aren't able to offer enough uh, short-term shelter. But we'll continue to work on it. And the county has definitely been a partner with us. Um, looking at other short-term shelter sites, they are difficult. Other sites like the transitional shelter, like 1220, which is really working quite well. We've had some significant results. We're also looking at a additional short-term shelter at the Housing Matters location. 
So we I have a few things on um, out there that we're still working on to come to fruition that will help with the encampments. But you're right, it, while we're gaining more resources to try to address it, it's still a growing, it's not necessarily shrinking, it's growing. If I could follow up, thank you for that. Um, it's, and I'm, so one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do here, and I probably didn't make that clear, is differentiate between the question of moving people and um, and the waste management question. Oh. Um, because we, you know, we have, we know that there are people who are not, um, for a variety of reasons, going to be able to make, uh, utilize the shelter or don't want to. Um, and others have just barriers, access barriers related to the work schedules and all kinds of other things. Um, I hear about these on a pretty regular basis because I talk to people who are located in the Benchlands. I talk to people who spend time there. Um, and so, you know, I, there's just reasons why that, that's not gonna be the solution for everyone. Um, so, but what I'm talking about more is the, we know that where people are, if there's no trash cans and there's no regular trash pickup, um, that it just, it piles up. So, you know, when we talk about entrenchment of camps, I'm talking about the entrenchment of trash. Um, and so I, I guess I'm just, and, and that is something that just requires human labor and, um, you know, some, uh, not really infrastructure, but some equipment to deal with. Um, there's a cost to that, but, um, and, you know, up front, it tends to, you know, I don't have any study in front of me to prove this, but I'm pretty sure, um, based on what on the anecdotal evidence um, and what I hear from people who do this work, trash pickup, um, that doing it, up, you know, ongoing and upfront is a much more effective and co or cost-effective way to deal with it. So uh, that's what I'm really hoping that we can, in your planning conversations, I mean, that's just a reality. We can't, you know, we, we can hope that people are going to make use of shelter. We can hope that there's going to be enough spaces available, but people are still going to be in spaces that don't have um, and don't have the ability to um, remove refuse on a regular basis. So I just am wanting to, I'd like to see more of a, yeah. that be a priority for us, <laughs> right? If I could answer and respond to that, we are moving in that direction. We just hired our, our field service supervisor uh, that's uh, solely focused on homelessness. We have uh, the positions are, are going to be filled for the, the maintenance workers that should be filled anytime now. So definitely getting that team in place that that is one of the issues. We also do, as we hear, have uh, refuse bins uh, placed. Oftentimes they're in, in locations that we're familiar with. They're vandalized and um, people don't always make it to the trash, right? So. <laughs> So there are a lot of efforts that we have done. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that we'll put big the big blocking bins out there, not even locked, um, but then they're 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 destroyed or fires. But we'll continue to do it and we'll continue to address it. And if people see other spots that are high uh, that maybe we haven't quite seen, again encourage the report so we can try to address whatever the the environmental issues that might be happening. But the field service. Um, Supervisors should be starting within the next two to three weeks. So that's exciting. And those are the kinds of things that that team is going to go after. Thank you. Um, before I give up the floor, I just do want to say um, I appreciate the, the um, intensity and the magnitude of the effort at the Benchlands. Um, however, I, I just want to remind us all that um, a lot of the material that was removed was not necessarily trash. Um, you know, a lot of people's survival belongings were part of that and, um, you know, because people don't have anywhere to go. So it, it is um, a cleanup issue. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, but, you know, I just want to remind people that that, you know, there's a, there are other ways to think about addressing a lot of that material that without doing it in the, in the, as a trash cleanup. So I'll just leave it there for now since this isn't an item on our agenda today. But thank you for the update. Thank you. Are there any other uh, council member uh, questions? Uh, council member Myers, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Lisa, I just had a question, just trying to get a sense of sort of those accepting shelter. Um, I've seen numbers that 
you know, on the weekly reports that I think you provide, do you have a sense of folks who are sort of moving into shelter versus not moving into shelter in terms of sort of, you know, I, I've seen counts obviously now that we're, we're contacting folks. And are there also other um, opportunities being offered such as, you know, uh, assistance with getting travel money home or what have you, um, or, and then also just wanna understand additional services. My understanding is that there was, um, there's both domestic violence crisis support there on site, and there is also case management um, as well being offered there. So I'm just trying to get a little bit of a sense of sort of, are most people not accepting shelter or, you know, kind of just get a general sense of that. Thank you. Yeah. For, uh, for, understanding a reasons, yeah, a variety of reasons. I think that Councilman Brown even pointed out of those individuals not accepting the shelter up at the overlook, convenience uh, factors, trying to get to and from work, which we understand. So about about one in three is sort of the estimate, but there's about 50 so far that have accepted shelter there. Um, and we've moved some individuals to, to 1220 who, because some individuals have 1220 have been able to find other housing. You've mentioned all of the outreach workers are there. We also include public health is down there quite frequently as, as well. Uh, you know, nursing, uh, outreach workers, homeward bound, the utilization of the homeward bound process, family members still showing up occasionally um, to provide assistance. But all of the outreach workers that are down there, the variety of the amazing mass service trying to connect individuals who do have, some individuals have their housing vouchers and are still trying to connect. That's a, that's a very difficult thing that's occurring that we want to see those folks who are already ready to go, not having a place to be accepted just yet. But um, yes, there are, there are not a lot of options. That's the problem. We, we need more options and more for folks to be able to um, meet their needs the way that, that works best for them. And I just, again, want to do, want to commend all the outreach workers that from across the system, from the numerous, um, you know, from the county, our city, uh, all the nonprofits, the, the work is incredible. They're down there every day trying to connect people to services just to get them their vital documents, right? So that, and they can, so they can try to get housing, the, the very basics. Um, but the work is ongoing and they still continue to go up to the overlook the, at the armory and they go up there to try to provide, continue providing services to those folks there as well. Thank you. I know we'll get an update at our next meeting. So I don't want to ask too many questions, but I do just want to recognize um, Jeremy and Chris and Monica, um, you know, just, and, and Larry and the team, I, I've gone over and visited as well and, and, and spoken with county staff and, have seen the uh, you know the the box that has been set up the um, you know the basically the travel box that is now basically a functional office trying to help people get connected. Um, so I just for the public's um, knowledge, you know, this is probably the largest, most organized, most sophisticated um, uh, decampment of folks um, that unfortunately have been living in an area for two and a half years, including going through a major flood last year where many of them lost all of their belongings. Um, so it's not safe to be on a, on a floodplain. Uh, we learned that unfortunately last winter. And um, so I just really wanna compliment our staff um, and all the work they've been doing. I think that we have been um, really providing um, stellar services and communications and really understanding a lot more about what's happening in um, encampments like this one in the city. So thank you, Lisa, for the report. Thank you, Council Member Myers, very much. Council Member uh, Golder and then Council Member Cummings. I, I don't wanna beat a dead horse, but I wanna thank Council Member Myers for her comments. I, you know, a, agree, appreciate, and want to thank the staff and all the efforts um, in this encampment cleanup. I was wondering, I, I was walking through there two Fridays ago, I walked through twice during the day, and I'm wondering if there is any collaboration with um, probation or PD. Um, you know, I had an opportunity the la over the last course of last year to spend a lot of time in Department 3 at the court. And I've just been watching and listening and seeing lots of failures to appear 
and um, a lot of the people are transient in nature, and I'm just wondering if people that don't want help perhaps have uh, warrants or can be picked up and and you know checked and maybe sent to other counties with criminal cases pending. I don't know, and so I'm just wondering if if that's happening in the um, in the efforts as well. Thank you. I see Chief Escalante has joined us. Yeah. Hi, Mayor Brunner and council members. Uh, so to, to answer the question, we uh, have had anywhere between three to four officers assigned to this operation the entire time, um, from a lieutenant to a sergeant and two officers. Additionally, we had two community service officers that are part of the encampment team um, that have been assigned to this operation the entire time. Uh, and we've also collaborated with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office uh, FIT team, focused uh, intervention team, which also addresses some of the um, folks that, you know, that are, uh, the attempt is to get them towards services, whether it's addiction services, mental health services, or medical services, um, to try to address some of their behaviors. So um, we have not had uh, probation necessarily down there with us, but um, there's been a lot of effort from the law enforcement side to, to address some of the, the issues that you, you bring up. I had um, council member Cummings next and then I'll, yeah, I'll let you speak when it's your turn. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions? Thank you. I had a, um, a question that was kind of related to something that Council Member Myers brought up. I um, just wanted to get a little bit of clarification on the timeline for the closure. And then um, in the event that there is, let's say, you know, an atmospheric river event, similar to what we saw last year, that may happen within the next few weeks, because uh, generally the end of October is kind of the beginning of the rainy season here in Santa Cruz. And so just wondering, you know, what uh, the plans are for if there is an emergency event where we need to evacuate the bench lines. Thank you for your question, Council Member Cummings. Uh, well, I've been working closely with fire and there is not uh, any information forthcoming of an atmospheric river or rain in the, in the forecast, but we do have Chief Odie who's with us every week when we meet with our, our, our um, bench lands IAP to give us updates. The expected closure is by the first week of November, uh, and where, in terms of um, where we are with that, with it, this is that's one, two, three and a half weeks. We think that we'll be in good shape. Uh, I think, in terms of uh, if we had some um, uh, unforeseen event occur for a, a atmospheric event, we would have to uh, our, our emergency operations plan would kick back in. Uh, like I said, we meet twice actually twice a week, and we would have to develop our plans for that. And I think with the assistance of PD um, and fire and having already gone through this, we'd have the ability to adjust quite quickly with the information that we'd have to, to provide alternative housing. There's probably about, I think, um, somewhere in the neighborhood, 50 to 60 individuals still there. And again, each week we're able to move approximately 30 um, individuals. So if it, something happened within the next three weeks, we'd probably be down to approximately 30 individuals uh, that we would need to find alternative shelter for. That's all, that was, those are all my Thank questions. you. Yeah. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to Council Member Golder's question. Um, the county did uh, recently get a competitive state grant in, in partnership with Public Defender's Office, Probation, the Courts, and the DA's Office, and part of that is to um, send out public defenders to encampments like the bench lands um, and to search for warrants and then divert folks into um, systems of care. And I, and I think that kicked off a couple of weeks ago. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. That was a <laughs> good discussion, good questions, comments. Uh, thank you for stepping in and filling the city manager's report. You're welcome. 
Okay, at this time in our agenda item 11, the city clerk will provide any updates to our calendar. There are none. Thank okay, you. thank you. Next up is the consent agenda. These are items 12 through 23 on our agenda with the exception of item 21. Item 21, SEIU Local 521 tentative agreement for a successor <laughs> memorandum of understanding has been pulled from the agenda and will not be discussed, which means we will not be taking public <laughs> comment on this item. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you wish to comment on items 12 through 23 with the exception of item 21. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. Raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or <coughs> selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Okay, I'm gonna start on my left with council member Brown. I'd like to pull item 15 and I have a question on 23. Okay, council member Brown is pulling 15 and a question on 23. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I want to comment on 18, please. Comment on 18. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just had a comment for 18 as well. 18, <coughs> Cummings. And Vice Mayor Watkins. 18. <laughs> and Council Member Golder. I'll yield my time to my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. So um, with that, we have pulled item number 15. So we'll, we will come back to that item. Um, and I'll call uh, for, I'll start with the uh, item uh, 18 with all the comments and then I'll go to question on 23. So um, let's see, Vice Mayor Watkins, you had a comment on item 18. I just wanna thank Council Member um, Kalantari Johnson and you, Mayor Bruner, for signing on to this resolution in um, solidarity with the women and the people in Iran who are standing up for um, women's rights and their choices. And I think we all observe what's happening on the news on a regular basis internationally in terms of the struggle and the fallout after the event that um, started the protests and just really want to applaud all of those who have such courage to really stand up for what's right and so just really appreciative to bring this forward thank you council member cummings i had a comment on item number 18. yeah i just wanted to thank i know that we had received an email from a member of the public who asked um, this to come on the agenda and so i'm glad to see that there were council members who were able to meet that request and put this item on the agenda because um, it really is important that um, we are standing up against um, oppression in all forms throughout the world um, and here in our community as well. And you know, this highlights just another instance where we see this occurring in the world, but we also you know, are currently continuing to watch Russian aggression on the people of Ukraine. We're still addressing the treatment of Latinos here who are crossing the border and how they're treated by um, ICE agents in our country. And we see how black people are, getting, are continuing to be wrongfully treated in our country as well. And I think we need to continue to acknowledge um, injustice where it occurs and stand up for the rights of all people throughout our world. And so I'm um, very supportive of this and just wanna express that as we move forward. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you and thank you to you, Mayor, and you, Vice Mayor, um, for co-authoring this and bringing this forward. I, I do wanna give an update that since we submitted this for the packet, the death rate has gone upwards to 185 people. 19 of those are children. 
Um, so this is really, really important that uh, we continue to give voice to this and we continue. So my call to action to all of you, my colleagues, and all of you in our community is to continue to give voice to this in any way that you can, because that's how change will happen is we, if we put pressure. Um, so thank you for acknowledging this and um, hopefully supporting this. Thank you, uh, Council Member Callan Terry Johnson. And for those of you that don't have an agenda in front of you, item number 18 that was just commented on is a resolution supporting the rights of people of Iran to free expression and standing in solidarity with the women and people of Iran. Uh, <laughs> Our next item is a question for agenda item number 23, and that is um, HSIP 10, Unsignalized Crossing Improvement Project, advertised for bids and award contract. It's a public works item, and Council Member Brown had a question. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to the preparers of this agenda item, I, um, which I absolutely support. I um, and I, I, one of my questions was about the uh, kind of specific plans around the uh, crossings that were identified. Um, but I think I figured that out, that, and th that's in the materials that are available on the, the website. So I'm just going to stick with one question here. And, but it would be helpful to get, like, if there's any way that we can get with items like this a list of just like here's the intersections we're gonna do, because we have seven different countermeasures, improvements, whatever you wanna call them, um, possible, like which ones are happening in, in what location. Um, I found it, so I won't ask <laughs> about it here, but um, it, it would just, you know, because it, it, it would just be helpful to have a sense of what's coming. And I really am very excited about pedestrian safety improvements, so um, I appreciate all of your work to make this happen. Uh, I'll just ask my one question, which is about the um, selection of the Almar site um, along the rail trail and the need for stop signs along the rail trail. Is that um, that's a requirement? That is that something we have to do? Um, I've heard some uh, um, feed racers <laughs> who like to use that rail trail have suggested it's a, it's a challenge for them to, um, and that some streets are just easier to move on. So I'm um, just wondering about that one in particular. I see Nathan shaking your head a little. Uh, Thank you, uh, council members. Uh, Nathan Wynn, assistant director of public works. I'll, I'll field that question uh, with regards to the rail trail design. Um, with regards to that, back in you know, 2018, when we, when we took uh, segment seven, phase one, the approach with the roadway crossings on rail trail segment seven phase one was to include stop signs at each of the crossings because it acts as a mid block crossing, which is standard to have a stop control for the users at the mid block crossing and not stop the roadway um, uh, for, in this case, for, would be for the trail. Um, what we decided back then is that we would use the stop control as a more conservative measure to reduce exposure to the city with regards to liability. If there was a question about who should be yielding when um, in, in a mid block crossing, again, that's why it's standard for the uh, trail users to stop in a mid block. Now, if volumes in the future, but we also said at that time, and when we approved the project was that if volumes and uh, things change in the future, um, that as staff, we bring that back to, to council to, to consider whether we would um, change or improve those type of uh, stop control or, or trap control devices along the rail trail. Gotcha. So that thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I I remember the the segment seven work, but not every detail. So that's very helpful. Um, so is this just one that what hadn't occurred yet? Is that so? Uh, Almar Crossing actually has stop control, and it currently does have an RRFB, so a rectangular okay. rapid flashing beacon, and that actually is essentially this project. You know, each location, those uh, five or six locations in this project, are going to get those beacon crossings, uh, pedestrian activated beacons at each one of these crossings. In this case, Almar actually has some that are existing, but we're actually relocating the westbound RRFB uh, head push button. So it's on the right hand side for the trail users. So that's the update we're making in Almar, but it does currently have an actual RRB device there. 
Thank you. That, that's what I thought, and I, so um, I was trying to kind of put it all together. Thank you. Really appreciate the explanation. Yeah, no problem. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for answering and being available. Uh, so our next step then is um, to move on to public comment on agenda items, uh, consent agenda items 12 through 23 with the exception of 21 that was um, pulled and 15 as well was pulled. So um, I will now look out to our virtual audience. Uh, if you would like to comment on the consent agenda items, please raise your hand by uh, pressing star nine or choosing the raise hand feature in your webinar controls. If you are joining us in person, you can line up to um, my left of the dais. And it looks like we have one hand in our virtual attendees. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. I see I am watching you. Uh, yes, hi. Um, only 10 states uh, still have declared COVID states of emergency and nine of those have very near expiration dates but the French Laundry Emperor Newsom's California has no basic COVID emergency state expiration. And 49 states are going one way and Gavin goes the other. That's not leadership, it's probably worse than hubris. Florida's Surgeon General now recommends against vaccinations for younger men due to links to heart problems. Go alone, Gavin insists all students be vaccinated. You state positive cases and hospitalizations continue to fluctuate. The nature of the pandemic is unpredictable and transmission rates have the potential to rise quickly. Unpredictability and potential are not justifications for emergency declarations. Duh and duh. Illness has always fluctuated by seasons. Biden said the pandemic is over. And ignored concern is increased all-cause mortality. Hey, where's all the city council going? Anyway. Um, even not including deaths from COVID, I believe death rates are still above average despite a million of previous past COVID deaths among the then soon to die anyway old and vulnerable that should have brought current death rates down to below normal by now, as well as due to any real positive efficacy of vaccines. Alarmingly, those have not done so. Something is wrong that is not spoken of as an emergency. Instead, just the stale COVID fear narrative is still an emergency when nothing, absolutely nothing, has been proven accomplished by these emergency declarations for at least a year, providing any measurable improvement to achieve normal mortality. Something, I suspect the government's response, including COVID vaccinations, is actually harming health going forward. Young people are dropping dead like never before. The CDC or FDA hit analysis of COVID adverse effects data and vaccine trial data. Lawsuits are required to obtain any factual truth. Uh, okay. Uh, there were too many mistruths told about two weeks to flatten the curve, lockdowns, mass herd immunity, natural immunity, origin of COVID, the blocked alternative treatments, methods of transmission, social distancing, age risk reward, and the smear and destroy campaign leveled against all or anyone with different or learned opinions has now severed any trust in government health mandates and their stooge media propagandists that they ever had. This continued emergency declaration to me is just one more government lie similar to the if you get the vaccine, you can't get COVID stone face lie that yes, the CDC, Fauci, Collins and Joe Biden most definitely told us until the truth came out, but they never admitted they lied. The suppressed truth of the damage caused and continuing by the COVID government response is being uncovered. How can it possibly be acceptable that new strain double strength vaccines were tested on only eight mice? I've had enough. Obey and be safe. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, I will now go to members here in person. Uh, go ahead and step forward and make sure the microphone's at your mouth. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I leave a quarter here. Do I get an extra 10 minutes? No, I'm just kidding. There we go. Um, uh, this is, I'm assuming this is uh, 12, uh, agenda item 12. Uh, that's 
largely what that gentleman was talking about. Excuse me. It, excuse me. Any any of the any of them? Oh okay, yeah. Well, uh, I guess mainly yeah. I'm interested in that. I had a conversation with one of the world's premier, um, very very special experience. Uh, uh, Harry Noller, uh, professor emeritus at UCSC, talked to me about RNA biology, and he he's uh, as I as I said he's uh, one of the world's premier uh, RNA biologists, and he told me uh, you know one thing we discussed was the fact that. RNA viruses uh, mutate uh, much more rapidly. Uh, so DNA uh, is much more stable, and it's one of the reasons why RNA uses it to store information. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, COVID is a, is a, is a rapidly changing, uh, coronavirus uh, is a rapidly changing RNA. Um, I think it's single-stranded. Um, anyway, anyway, it might be double stranded. Uh, anyway, but it's an RNA, so the mutations occur more, more you know, to to a much uh, a much more frequent uh, uh, extent than uh, the uh, than DNA uh, viruses and, and such. So, so COVID, you know, typically is gonna is gonna have uh, mutations and mutations. So we have strains and strains. Now we just have Omicron and subvariants of Omicron. They've refused to kind of go past Omicron mainly because. Uh, maladaptive uh, mutations are occurring. So really, uh, it's getting less and less ferocious. COVID really, really is. I mean, in some in some ways, really, the, the prevalent, prevalent strains are less frightening to scientists. And I just, I actually, I just feel like, yeah, maybe, you know, 60 days more of an emergency declaration after that, you might consider just doing away with the emergency declaration, because mainly you're not hearing about the same numbers of fatalities uh, I have 51, 49 minutes. Um, I'm going to uh, turn them over to Mark. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Uh, I will now look to our next person here in person. Hi there, welcome. I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing right now, but am I allowed to comment on the consent agenda? Yes, okay. consent agenda item, with the exception of 21 or 15. 21 was okay. SEIU, and 15 is uh, the wharf okay. item. In general, um, my point in speaking today is I am, I am just really getting unnerved and alarmed by the situation with the lack of housing in Santa Cruz. And as we all know, it's a problem. So um, when I say that, what I'm really trying to talk about is, first of all, I recently found out that affordable housing, what it really means is that it's affordable for the <laughs> developers to build. It's not necessarily, in other words, the construction of the unit is affordable. So I just, I want to say that out loud. I also want to say that I have become aware that the city is in negotiations with developers, and this is pertaining to item number 19, to give away free land to out-of-town developers. Um, and I just really have to call this into question. Um, the last thing that I just want to say is about this, that I, I think that it is absolutely morally important. It's a moral imperative at this point to build low-income housing and completely subsidized housing in the city of Santa Cruz, as it is important to build it in the county and in many other cities across the country. So I just wanted to say that about that. And um, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members, any other members of the public? Um, I wonder if um, I could just. There is someone with their hand raised and for choice. Oh, great. OK, let me go to virtual. I see a hand raise. We are taking public comment on consent agenda items with the exception of 21 and 15. Go ahead and press star six, phone number ending in 2915. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you for having the hybrid uh, ability for the public to join your meetings. I appreciate it. I wanted to talk with you a bit about uh, the Pure Water SoCal project that is certainly causing a lot of conundrum in the city streets of Santa Cruz. But most importantly, I want to point out to your council that the Laurel Street Bridge portion of the conveyance project Can I ask was you delayed. a quick question? What item are you speaking to on the consent agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. I just joined and I thought this was public comment. Public comment on the consent agenda items. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was public comment, which is scheduled for 515. So, oh, yes. Uh, that was oral communications and um, that will be next. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, no, don't I'll wait and join in a little bit then. Thank you. I apologize. That's okay. I just wanted to be clear about which item so we could be clear. Uh, Okay, uh, it looks like that is it for uh, public comment on consent agenda items. Um, and I just wanted to briefly, on a uh, member of the public spoke on agenda item 19, Pacific Station South Affordable Housing Project, which is 100% um, affordable housing, it's one of the city's low income housing, 100% uh, low income housing units at the metro station there. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so at this time we will go to, uh, we've done public announce, uh, public comment on agenda and now I will look for a vote on. I'll make a motion. Okay, we have a Vice Mayor Watkins has uh, made a motion. I'll second. And Cummings has seconded. May we have a roll call vote? Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? She's sorry, yeah. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> um, what is your vote for? Uh, did you register your vote, Council Member Myers? Aye. Yes, aye. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. And now we will go to consent agenda item number 15. That was pulled by uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. So this item is, uh, we, are, we are here with this item today to rescind the Wharf Master Plan and the Environmental Impact Report as a result of um, legal action taken uh, and our non-compliance with CEQA uh, around uh, particular elements of that master plan. Um, I won't go into the history of that and um, lament the delays. But I, um, I will, I, I did just want to raise this here and ask a couple of questions about um, the process moving forward. Um, so we are being asked to rescind the non-objectionable portions of the master plan so, and EIR. Sorry, Councilman Brown, can I ask a point yeah. of order? Yeah. Just because I know that if we have a hard stop at yeah, I know. for, I know. I'm wondering if maybe we could hear this item after oh. oral communications because if we break up this this discussion to go into oral communications and come back, people aren't really gonna you know may have forgotten you know the reasons why this was brought up. So I, I'm I'm fine with that. I don't want I, my hope is to not belabor it. I'm just trying to give you the the basics. But I understand if we do, are gonna have to shift gears, then I'm happy to wait. Okay. So there are. are Couple members of the public would like to speak on this. Yes. So at this time we will. It's really up to the pleasure of the chair how you want. Yes, we will um, pause uh, consent the pulled consent agenda item 15 in order to adhere to our oral communications time of 5:15. And um, at, so at this time, thank you, Council Member Brown, and thank you, Council Member Cummings. 
at this time, uh, if you would like to uh, speak to oral communications for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, oral communications is an opportunity to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, raise your hand by dialing star nine or select raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. If you are joining us here in person, you can please line up to my left, your right, and you will have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it's not required. And please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public on anything not on today's agenda. We are also not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public during this portion, but when we are able, we can address the questions raised after oral communications has completed. Okay, so I will look, I see a couple of hands, and I see one person in person. So I will start with our virtual attendee. Uh, the first hand raised is the name, I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am moved to recite part of Tulsi Gabbard's amazing speech today. Quote, I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that is now under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness who divide us by racializing every issue and stoke anti-white racism, actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms, are hostile to people of faith and spirituality, demonize the police and protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, believe in open borders, weaponize the national security state to go after political opponents, and above all, dragging us ever closer to nuclear war. If, I, if you can no longer stomach the direction that so-called woke Democratic Party ideologues are taking our country, I invite you to join me, end quote. That's some spot-on heroic advice you know, that the machine will surely spatter its far-left smears of political opponents as racist Nazis, fascist extremists, and threats to democracy when actually those apply more so to themselves, if at all. Okay, enough of that. I'll offer some different stage advice. I'm voting no on everything. There's nothing on the ballot except woke garbage and masquerades of special interest. Uh, additionally, uh, for clarity and FYI, I will address that person with some real prejudicial chutzpah that called in last meeting asking I be denied my right to speech and declared the world globalist is a Ju Jewish ethnic slur. This is a fairly new false claim that any globalism is anti-Semitism. I had to look it up. Apparently, it started with the leftist mouthpiece New York Times doing a hit piece suggesting Steve Bannon supposedly was using globalist as a dog whistle term, meaning Jews for being behind global job outsourcing. Nobody, including Jews, gets a virtuosity pass on making false racist claims. There's no ethnic identity monopoly to being a powerful globalist, such as the WEF's Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, <laughs> and Joe Biden, with his national disgrace open border policy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, attendee virtually is phone number ending in 2316. Go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry, 2915. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hey, this is Becky Steinbrunner again. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome back. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, again, I apologize for my uh, misunderstanding earlier. I have actually three things I'd like to speak with your counsel about. The first one is what I had begun to talk about, the delay um, in the Pure Water SoCal project connecting the 14-inch diameter water, uh, recycled water. It's, it won't be recycled at that point. It'll be coming from the the sewage treatment plant on Bay Street to the new Chanticleer treatment plant in Live Oak. That 14-inch pipe will be connected to the Laurel Street Bridge as will a 6-inch pipe returning water that is purely full of contaminants, uh, including carcinogenic disinfection project, products. That's crossing the San Lorenzo River. 
and I have a lot of concerns about that. The reason it has been delayed was actually because the cliff swallows that nest under that bridge would have been disrupted in their raising their young over the summer. That's why it was delayed, but it is back in process now since the birds have migrated back to Argentina. So I want to make that concern about the water. If, if there were a seismic event, that water would go into the San Lorenzo Valley, and to my understanding, <coughs> there's no protection to monitor for real-time leaks. I'd like you to look into that, if you would, please. The second thing I want to talk with you about is the um, new pre-application that has been submitted for the very large project at 908 Ocean Street. It is a huge project, and a new developer is uh, coming onto the scene there. The city is going to spend $1.5 million next year improving Ocean Street, and I think this is a waste of taxpayer money given that a large developer will likely rip it up and should be doing the work. Becky, itself. that was your timer bell. All Feel right. free to I'll, email I'll us about my uh, with, with your third item. Okay, uh, it looks like that's it for virtual attendees. And so in person, please step forward. Welcome. Welcome back. Mayor Bruner. Um, I just want to say I've, I've been organizing and present at the Benchlands throughout the sweeps. And I think today's sweep was either the fourth or fifth one. And I just went down there to basically agitate and yell. I started out as a very law-abiding uh, person in my youth. And I find myself yelling epithets at the police because People, people need to understand that what is happening to our people, and I say our people regardless of immigration status, regardless of whatever brings them to this situation of being homeless, people have to understand that this is a failure, an utter and complete failure of our government. I myself had a journey, unfortunately, very sadly and tragically, through domestic violence, where I ended up homeless for part of it. My father was one of the highest level lawyers that anybody can ever achieve in this country, and his wife. And they were egregiously cruel people, but they pretended to care about me. And so it took me years. And I thank the good people who ran the shelters here and helped me stay alive during the rains in the winter. It was a long and difficult journey and I was a successful, much awarded person in my youth. They couldn't give me enough words in high school. So I am trying to right now say that people wind up homeless. We need shelters. We need lots of shelter space. We need simple housing, basic housing needs. What's happening is utterly morally wrong. And I've made the point up here before that it is similar to how we came into the Holocaust. I'm not saying it equ equates with the Holocaust, but the kinds of demonizing of these people, the kind of conditions that they're living in. We are also refusing services. And some of the best activists, is the last sentence I'll say, feel that what is happening is the government is deliberately Your leaving timer. people yeah. unhoused and unserviced, very severe mental illnesses, no. absolutely unaddressed, so that they can scare house people and create the police state that we're seeing develop. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, our next person in person, welcome back. Again, I've got a lot of quarters in my pocket. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, so the. Uh, um, Occupy movement of 20, I think it was 2011. That was a big uh, Bernie moment. Um, there's a couple Bernie supporters on council, um, or more. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, Occupy movement uh, kind of established that if people didn't have a place to go, they were going to go to that park. And it was about four years. I don't. Uh, they've been there about three years now. Say three years. They've been in the benchlands, and uh, I I uh, I kind of conspired with. Um, 
uh, uh, Brent Adams uh, to, to, to let them be there. All I said was, I will treat the wounded. It's, and you know what, there's, there's, no, there's nobody over there who's moving out right now who has suffered harm as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there was some talk of a lynching back in 1877, but that was a different bridge, a different time, a different thing entirely. Okay, there are people over there. There's uh, 200 tons of trash. That's uh, almost, almost 2,000 pounds of trash per camp. Wait a second, that can't be accurate. I, 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 wanna, I wanna question that, I wanna question that. Is there really two, 200 tons of trash they've taken out of there? I think most of it's just, they've just scooped down deep and taken away some of our park, okay? And some of those people had nowhere else to go. Boise, Idaho, the precedent where they said, if you can't give them an option, they get to take one. And that's very, very fair. So, anyways, I have an article here. Uh, it's by uh, Mike Bonin, the LA uh, City Councilman, uh, recently in the news because of the kind of outrageous comments by some of his colleagues. He's talking about the acuity of homeless people. And the, acute, uh, the acute get the help, but then uh, the safety net for uh, everybody else is kind of uh, lowered. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any other uh, comments for oral communications? I don't see any virtual attendees with their hands raised. Okay, uh, that concludes oral communications. So I will now bring it back to our consent agenda item. We are on item number 15, which was pulled. Council Member Brown, thank you. Oh, thank you. I will hand it back to you. Hey, hi. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> that um, so I, um, I w pulled this item on the, um, res the resolution rescinding the work master plan, which I do uh, support. Um, but I wanted to pull it because I do. This is a big project. This is a, you know, this is a, a lot, um, many components, and obviously uh, a lot of community interest. So. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if we could get a bit of an update. I have a lot of questions that kind of came up for me as a result of this agenda item, which I won't raise all of those here. I'll send them along. Um, just It would be helpful to get updates on where some of the um, items that were not um, stopped through the lawsuit um, process, um, where they're at, how, you know, how we're moving along. Those are really important maintenance and, and uh, restoration issues. Um, but with respect to what will happen next, I'd just like to get a, a, some overview of how the city intends to move forward with circulation of the new EIR, um, the, you know, when that, I, I saw kind of a general timeline, but just what's going to happen. And um, so I'll, I'll ask the general question and I may have a couple specific follow-ups. Yes, um, without going into too much detail, the court uh, invalidated the EIR that was prepared in connection with the Wharf Master Plan, and in so doing, uh, directed the, the city to rescind the resolution that uh, certified the EIR and also the resolution that approved the Wharf Master Plan. And uh, the court, in sort of a footnote, um, stated that the ruling did not prevent uh, did not prevent the city from moving forward with components of the project that were not found invalid in um, in the judgment. And also, the plaintiffs in the case were amenable to the city moving forward with those components, including the wharf gate and a couple of other um, fairly minor aspects of the wharf master plan. Um, what is happening now is that the city, per the court's direction, is in the process of preparing uh, an amended or revised EIR to address the infirmities that the court found in, in his, that Judge Burdick found in, in his decision. And I'm not aware of the specific timing of that, but I expect it to return to the city council either late this year, or early next year. Um, okay, um, thanks. I, can I ask some follow-up questions then? Because I, I got that from the 
Agenda Report and, and conversations I've had. Thank you for uh, your overview. Um, is the intention to release the revised EIR for the total project um, only the sections that were um, uh, rejected by the judge? And um, so that's one. And then um, what's the, the next steps? Where will, this, will it come back to the council? <coughs> My understanding is that the EIR is being prepared to be recirculated, but the court only identified a, a couple of minor issues that need to be addressed in the revised document. So I expect it to come back looking um, similar, very similar to the EIR that was presented to the council at the last, um, at, when it last considered this, but um, specifically addressing the issues that Judge Burdick identified in his ruling. Right. So that would come. So then, this, so I just make. I want to be clear here. The, so the EIR would be circulated, comments, and then it comes to the council for certification. It That's right. Go to the planning commission first. Uh, the then the document, the I believe, will be uh, a draft will be made available to the public for comment pursuant to the requirements of CEQA, a 45-day comment period. Um, that will be received. Uh, the, the staff and its Environmental consultant will prepare responses to the comments and make any corrections or you know, minor changes that are necessary in view of the comments, and then a final version will come back to the city council for certification uh, with with the comments and the responses to comments. Okay, so then the the council will get the final version, and the only at, based on the current plan, the only opportunity for public input will be through the 45-day comment period? That is, that, is the, that is the CEQA process, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are, there's other parts of the CEQA process, for example, scoping uh, meetings and talking with the public. Um, so I, I just that, wanted to see is, what was in uh, part of the plan. That's absolutely correct. But in this case, um, you know, the project is very clearly defined, and the, the court based its decision on a very a very limited uh, number of issues that were identified as um, not properly addressed in the in the uh, EIR that the council certified. Got it. Thank I, I was really I don't, I don't trying think to it's understand going to, the process moving forward. Yeah, it's not going to be a completely new ball game. It's just going to be fixing what was found defective and bringing that back. To, um, you know, making that available for, to the public for comments and then bringing it back to the council. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, Larry, I'll save my, I have a comment, comments for afterwards. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other further questions before we go out to public comment on this item? Okay. If I could, um, just so it's clear for the public, uh, we received some comments from uh, plaintiff's <coughs> counsel this afternoon who had not had an opportunity to review the draft resolution that was in your agenda packet that was distributed last Thursday. Uh, we took those comments into account and agreed that some uh, minor edits should be made to the resolution. So there is a hard copy of a revised resolution with red line markings showing the changes. Uh, and my understanding is that there are a couple of, uh, of hard copies available for members of the public in the audience today. Uh, and I believe they are also posted uh, online for uh, people who are viewing the meeting remotely. Great, and I see the hard copy here. It looks like the last two paragraphs are where the red line um, That's right. changes were made. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, at this time, I will now uh, bring it this item, consent agenda item 15 out for public comment. If you are joining us virtually, now is the time to press star nine to raise your hand to speak to this item. And if you are joining us in person, please line up to my left and um, I will alternate back and forth. And I'll start with in person. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, council members. Um, my name is Gillian Greenside, 
and uh, I'm here today speaking on behalf of the community group Don't Morph the Wharf. And uh, thank you for um, uh, updating and making this uh, revisions um, to the resolution available. Um, so the approval uh, to the resolution um, is what you are voting on is to set aside the um, environmental impact report and the um, master plan. And uh, as you read in uh, your in the resolution, that uh, don't morph the wharf uh, recommended and allowed certain projects to go ahead, uh, not subject to further environmental review. Um, we didn't feel that they were minor, uh, with all due respect. Uh, we feel that they are major aspects, and, and uh, most of them um, are involved with protecting the wharf and for its longevity and its structural security, it includes replacing the road and the substrate, the 5% of pilings that need to be replaced. The biggest uh, maintenance cost on the wharf is for the uh, um, dump trucks and the, uh, the heavy equipment. So those were big items. So we hope the city will go ahead with those. We didn't stand in the way of those. And uh, I see a bit of work has started on the road, which is good. And the migratory birds have uh, flown back to um, Puget Sound. And uh, so we've got a window to complete that work. Uh, so it's not minor. And I have to admit that we hoped uh, that that would be sufficient. Um, however, you have decided to go ahead and do a revised environmental impact report um, and um, a master, another master plan. And with all due respect, again, we don't feel that what uh, the judgment of the court nor what was raised are just minor issues, um, that uh, they are actually issues of great concern to the community. As many of you know, there was uh, really widespread community um, opposition and concern about the changes that were proposed and a lot of input. I'm sorry, the time wasn't going here. I didn't know. Oh, it's up there. Well, I, could, I need to just add that we ask that you do do a, a notice of preparation for your revised EIR and that you hold a scoping meeting so the community can weigh in. We're eager to move forward with you. We want this to be in a good spirit, but to not have those meetings, uh, to allow the public to weigh in and guide what your objectives will be won't be starting on a good footing. So we hope that you will Thank ask you. that go ahead with a um, scoping meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Please step forward. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Aird. I would like to just echo uh, what has been stayed, stated here by Julian Greenside. Um, this issue has been very controversial. You know that there have been over 1,600 plus people that signed petitions against the plan. You have an opportunity. This is sort of a signal. The judgment has been made. This is a signal that this plan had major deficiencies. The council is going to be changing in a matter of months in terms of its composition. You've got a lot of other controversial issues on the plate of the new council. I think you should take an opportunity here, uh, which is more in the spirit that Julian spoke to, to make sure that there's a real opportunity during this pause period to hear from the public again and make sure that your 
plan is more consistent with what this community wants. And if you feel that that's a step back, I would say it's an opportunity to gain the community support, which you should be reflecting. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody else in person joining us that would like to speak to oral communications? Any item not on? I'm sorry. <laughs> we went back to item 15, <laughs> the wharf uh, item. I don't see any virtual hands raised. OK. I will bring it back to council. Um, I'm wondering if city attorney, you can just briefly speak to um, the the differences with a scoping meeting and the 45 day period. Yeah, a scoping meeting is typically done um, when you are initially setting out to define a project, and uh, it it um, guides issues like what is the definition of the project, what are potential alternatives to the project. It's really starting from square one with the, the EIR process. Um, to my understanding, that is not what is required by the court here. The council could always, um, you know, uh, on its own, decide to um, begin over from square one, but, but that's not what is, what is required by the terms of the judgment. So um, what the, the position we're in right now is really just to address the deficiencies that were found by the court in the EIR and then to bring it back to the council to correct what the court found was, was improper. And um, you know, at any time, the count, this council or any future council can amend the Wharf Master Plan to add or to eliminate any components that are contained in the current plan. Um, and if that's the council's direction, then that will be the marching orders to the staff. But that's not what's required by this court decision. And that's what we're specifically trying to address with this evening's item. So uh, just to clarify, um, the 45 day period would be specific to the items um, that the court found had deficiencies and not a broader discussion it, it for the public be, to engage. Um, it wouldn't restrict members of the public from commenting on any item in the EIR. However, we did re receive extensive comments. Um, those were all addressed in responses to comments in the EIR. And there were a number of issues litigated in the case in most of them, the court found um, the ER was appropriately prepared. There were two, two issues that the court found lacking with respect to uh, the report's analysis of and mitigation measures for um, recreational impacts. And those had to do with the, the area where people fish out on, toward the end of the wharf and also the sea lion viewing holes. So, those were the specific issues that the court uh, asked to address, as well as I should add um, the Western Walkway and the analysis of the of the rationale for concluding that the alternative to the Western Walkway wasn't feasible. So, those are what are being addressed in the in the revised EIR that will be recirculated, um, but it won't prevent any any member of the public from commenting on any other aspect of the EIR. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I just have a quick question, and if, I don't know, Tony, you can speak to this, in terms of what was conducted in terms of uh, community outreach in the EIR process prior, um, you said that was sort of in compliance, and so I don't know if you want to speak or if you have any understanding of what that looked like. Yeah, the process that led to the council's adoption of the Wharf, the Wharf Master Plan was very extensive, and in particular, um, the um, the original Wharf Master Plan was analyzed and it was determined that with mitigation, the Wharf Master Plan would not have any significant impacts on the environment that would justify the circulation of an EIR. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, the council elected not, nevertheless to prepare an EIR for the project. So there was public comment on the initial 
uh, environmental document, um, the city took a step back and drafted an EIR, uh, received extensive public comment on the draft EIR, made extensive uh, comments on the public, or responses to the public comments, made certain uh, adjustments to the language of the EIR to address those comments and in the findings. Um, notwithstanding all that work, the court found a, a couple of areas lacking. And so, um, yes, there was extensive public comment. And again, um, there's nothing preventing the council from doing more uh, public outreach than is required. But what we're presenting you right now is just a, a step along the way that's required in order to comply with the terms of this judgment. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins, if you have more. Well, I just appreciate the clarification and also the understanding that there's going to be an opportunity for the public to weigh in either way. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to move the, the, item, the item and the recommendation. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Council Member Brown. I'd like to make a substitute motion. Okay. Well, this was a, I didn't have a second. So. Oh. Okay, I guess, do you need a second for a substitute? Is that required? Uh, I, I believe that the second was to Council Member Watkins. Or yeah, Vice no, Mayor I, but Watkins I do, so I had to wait until there was a second? I'm just asking It about has the rules. been seconded at this point, I believe. Okay, so I would like to make a substitute motion. Um, I'm gonna make my comments before I make that motion. Um, and now I feel even more <laughs> strongly about making these comments. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the legal guidance and um, all of your work on this, uh, Tony, and um, I'm, the, the arguments that I'm going to be making right now are political and um, also because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, so we're here tonight, again, once again, because almost two years ago, um, the council majority, a, a council majority, voted to approve uh, an EIR that had deficiencies. And they, um, I agree that they are not minor. Um, in the legal kind of technical world of specifics of the language, that it may feel that way, but these are really big issues. Um, a, a, a Western walkway, a massive tall building that's just going to be perched at the end of the wharf. Um, you know, those are big issues, and the community really cares about them. And we've seen that in the comments we've received, um, the attention that's been paid. And then with the failure of the um, city, of city leadership at that time to take those concerns seriously enough through a lawsuit. And I think it is in um, our interest to um, recognize that we're here because of mistakes that we have made and that we should take that seriously and we should um, provide an opportunity for the community to weigh in um, and talk about what they want to see in defining this project. Um, I think we've heard pretty loud and clearly some of the things they don't want to see. And um, the idea that we can vote at any time to amend um, kind of just doesn't, doesn't really feel like it's, it's an adequate, um, uh, a pr a adequate response to a challenge that we know we're going to be facing. We, I have sat here and watched the city push um, through um, projects, major projects that are going to define the, the direction of this city, um, and then we have to, and, and because it's so urgent that we have to move forward. Well, two years later, we're <laughs> we're talking about rescinding something that um, some of us said. Um, if it were revised, uh, you know, even in small ways, we might not be here. We could have just moved forward. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of perplexed as to how um, we would not take that very seriously and and actually do some more community engagement, um, have hold a scoping meeting. There's nothing that prevents us from doing it just because we're not legally required to do it. Well, that's true. Um, but I have a feeling we're going to be having more conversations in closed session about this item for years to come if we continue to not listen to, to the public um, and take those, those seriously. So my um, substitute motion is to um, uh, adopt the, the staff recommendation rescinding all but the, or rescinding the um, 
resolutions number NS29747 and NS29748, and to direct staff to um, issue an NOP and um, hold a scoping meeting as part of the um, recirculation or the circulation of the new environmental impact report. Okay, is there a uh, second to the substitute motion? I'll second. Okay. <coughs> and then <coughs> while I have the floor, I could just make a few comments on that. Um, so I, when this first came to council, um, we'd been hearing from members of the public, and um, I know that there were some changes that were requested to be made. We did go back and forth, and there were some changes, but I know that at the end, um, they weren't all the changes that members of the public wanted to see. And to Councilmember Brown's point, um, you know, there were obviously now deficiencies within that plan. I was one of the people who supported moving forward after meeting with staff and hearing from them and hoping to make some, um, um, to reach some kind of compromise with what was being asked of by the public and what the staff recommendations were. Um, but it's clear that, you know, this has now gone to the court once and the courts were able to find deficiencies, which means that we didn't, we weren't able to um, completely identify some of the holes within that plan. And you know, to the point of the people who came and, and spoke to us today, you know, it really is important that we're providing the community with the greatest amount of opportunity to have transparency around these issues. And what we've been finding consistently is when there is not transparency, we end up finding ourselves in court. And so I agree with Councilmember Brown that, you know, having heard from the public today and having gone through this process that, you know, we should support having another notice of preparation, having another scoping period. And, you know, people might say, well, that's going to delay this. But, you know, if we provide opportunities to hear from the public, that can keep us from ending up spending so much time and money in court. And it's part of our job to be fiscally responsible and so we don't need to be wasting um, taxpayer dollars on court fees when we can just take the time to actually hear from them, um, incorporate their concerns into our decision making and then move forward. So I'm happy to second this. Thank you. I have other council member hands raised. Um, City Attorney, can you um, again clarify a scoping meeting would happen in tandem uh, while during the 45 day period How, no well, a scoping meeting would essentially start the process over from square one but well, that's not what's required by the court here the court identified specific uh, issues that need to be addressed in a revised and recirculated report so it's not um, from a legal perspective it's it's just not necessary to do that um, I mean I, I would also add that um, well the EIR addresses environmental impacts associated with the project, and it analyzes environmental impacts of various components of the project, such as the landmark building, the sea lion viewing holes, the fishing area, and the western walkway. Um, it does not serve as a mechanism for, from a, from a legal perspective, it's not a mechanism for uh, a a policy decision about whether or not to move forward with the project. It's really a question of did the environmental review identify potential environmental impacts and appropriately mitigate for those? And if it can't be appropriately mitigated, then are there overriding considerations that would justify moving forward with the project notwithstanding those environmental impacts? So, um, you know, again, if the council wants to revisit the issues in the a wharf master plan itself as to whether or not it uh, it prefers to move forward with those. It's certainly, um, that would be a va valid positive uh, policy discussion to have, but it's, you know, in the context of what's required in order to comply with the court's order, it's much narrower than that. It's really just to go back and more uh, specifically address the issues that were identified by the court with respect to impacts to fishing, impacts to viewing holes, uh, and the analysis supporting the alternative of the Western Walkway. So the 45 day period is to address specifically the deficiencies. A scoping meeting would start everything from square one again. Right. 
it would start the whole EIR process over again. Okay. Um, and is there a timeline on that? What, uh, is there typically I, a, a period I of mean, time? I mean, I want to say that, 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 would... that the, that the uh, initial EIR from soup to nuts, the issuance of a draft environmental impact report probably took a year. I, I don't recall the specific timeline. And um, what would that impact? I'm not the best person to answer that question because I'm not as familiar Is, with um, the uh, components Bonnie of the Lipscomb project. Bonnie Lipscomb, maybe, or someone from city staff could speak to that. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, a, you know, a year delay um, at a minimum would just would hold the, the process up that we currently have in place. While I um, acknowledge and recognize that there's some elements that we can go forward. We have been moving forward on the pilings. It does put a, sort of an indefinite hold um, by resetting, restarting the environmental review process from the beginning um, for the project, I think would be more than a delay of year of just the preparation of the EIR. I think it just sort of, you know, resets the clock and the delay of that needed infrastructure investment in the war. I think now more than ever, you know, post pandemic, um, it's really critical for us to recommit and reinvest in one of our most amazing resources we have in our community. And my just concern on the staff level is that starting from beginning on the AIR would negatively impact um, the businesses and our resources on the wharf. Um, the other thing to consider would just be the cost um, involved in uh, starting from zero again on recirculating uh, and restarting a new ER process um, at a minimum. I would anticipate that would at least be 100,000, potentially more. What is that 100,000? I, I would say that is laid out in the emphasize is there will be an expanded, revised and expanded section in the EIR on recreation and recreational impacts. So that is an enhanced area that we're going beyond um, what was required um, in the judgment. If I could just follow up, I'd, I'd like to clarify something um, in response to Councilmember Brown's comments. I perhaps misspoke when I said that the issues identified by the, by the court were minor probably would have been better to say that there was a fairly narrow range of issues identified by the court. Uh, I recognize that, um, you know, fishing and um, the sea lion viewing holes are important components of the wharf experience and didn't mean to minimize that. Um, but they are a re relatively narrow slice of the issues that were reviewed in the entire EIR. Um, and so a, a do-over would be a, a very large undertaking to address a relatively narrow set of issues identified by the court. Thank you. I see Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Watkins, and Council Member Golder with hands up. So, and then Council Member Brown. Council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I definitely um, appreciate all of, all of my colleagues' concern about, you know, the public process around a major change on a facility such as the wharf. Um, but if I recall, and I appreciate Bonnie Lipscomb's additional information as well, Tony, as your clarification, you know, this is about a four year project um, now extended because of the lawsuit on the CEQA document. You know, CEQA documents are not planning documents. They're documents that actually look at the environmental impacts of the projects as Tony mentioned. Um, and so typically a scoping session that would be done for an EIR would be uh, really going backwards because it, we would be considering the same project. Um, and so in many ways it, it would be redundant and, and respending, you know, it sounds like maybe $100,000 on a new EIR when the court did narrowly define and um, did find, um, you know, deficiencies in, in in the CEQA analysis, let's make sure it's very, we're very clear that the deficiencies were not in the project as proposed. They were proposed, they were deficiencies in the actual environmental review that was written up as part of the CEQA documents. So um, I think we're kind of, you know, I, I'm not going to support this substitute motion. I, I'm frustrated to have to vote on something like this tonight um, on a consent agenda item. 
um, when we have important business to um, hopefully hear from our, our folks um, at SEIU this evening about their concerns. So, um, you know, I'm gonna not support the substitute motion. I feel that, um, you know, what's been laid out in terms of the reissuance re and re, uh, re-examination under the CEQA, you know, guidelines on how these specific impacts need to be re-evaluated and then brought back to our community are very valid. Obviously the court has directed that, um, but going backwards and re-scoping and putting out a new notice, you know, notice of intent, notice of preparation, all of those things are, you know, lots of secret acts, CEQA acronyms that sound right, but those are not going to, we're not going to rewrite, I hope, the WARF master plan. Um, and so I've heard comments um, that sound to some extent that we're looking backwards um, to, you know, make any decisions. The WARF is over a hundred years old. It is probably the most important piece of infrastructure besides the wastewater treatment plant and our water treatment plant that we have in the city of Santa Cruz and we are not able to maintain it. It's um, not living up to its true economic um, piece that it provides to our city. Um, and, you know, we have a lifeguard tower is a great example. It's falling down. So let's invest in our infrastructure. Let's figure out how to make the wharf a great place. Yes, some of the things that were in there were not, they were obviously not tenable but uh, you, you make your decisions as things get permitted. Um, there's always lots of other steps to go, but let's just get this piece of infrastructure taken care of. Let's not go backwards and do a whole nother EIR. Um, this doesn't make any sense for me. So I'm not gonna support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. No, you know, my questions were, were answered. Okay. Council member Golder. Um, I just have a, question and I don't know if maybe Bonnie you could answer it I'm wondering because of the lawsuit was there grant funding that we lost and would a further uh, delay cause us to lose additional funding we had grant funding actually that helped us with the preparation of the wharf master plan so that one has been concluded successfully um, we do have uh, grant funding for um, the pilings on the wharf and we've successfully matched that and that's going forward as as well so we don't have pending grant funding uh, specifically that's that's related to the actions before us today and then i just have like i just have a couple comments i don't think that there was a lack of public outreach regarding the wharf master plan initially um, I provided input as a private citizen, and I said even in my comments back then when we were voting on it that I thought the landmark building was hideous myself. But it, it's not about that, I think, at this point, and that's how I kind of feel like it is. I think that the um, plaintiffs in this case and other cases that we see in closed session sometimes had their opportunity. They don't like the direction that things went, and they have the means and the privilege to hire lawyers and fight and block things that are happening. And they're also really skilled at sending out messages to the community that people might not fully understand and then get behind and rally and support. And so I am not in agreement that there's this huge community group that wants to stop the wharf master plan. I think there was never a plan to remove the fishing or the sea lion viewing holes, there was a plan to move them, not remove them. And so to me, I agree with council member Myers, this feels like a waste of our time when we have important city business to do. And this something that I don't wanna discuss further and I'd like to just call the question on the on, on council member Brown's. I'm sorry, do I have questions that I would like to get answered? <laughs> and, okay. I mean, okay. Uh, I can't even get an item on the agenda okay. because I don't have two sub additional supporters, which for those of you out in the audience who don't know this, individual council members can't get items on the agenda um, unless they have at least two council members who are willing to sign on to an item. And this is an ongoing challenge. Um, I use the opportunities I have available to me and I am trying to make the point that if we continue to say, we let the public speak and we made our own decision that they will continue to challenge us in the ways that are available to them. And the legal process is one of them. And there is 
you know, to, to sh you know, shake our heads and say, not fair, you know, they're, they have privilege, is really just displacing our own lack of <laughs> being responsible and making the decision, listening to the community and trying to respond accordingly. And so I would like to ask the question now, how much money have we spent defending this lawsuit? Because I know we have a hired cons a, a, a firm, an outside firm that we are spending money on for this, as well as our own city attorney's budget that gets stretched very thin and, um, and he, they absorb that cost internally. Um, thank you, Tony, and your partners for that. But with outside counsel, we pay big bucks. So I'd like to know how much it's cost for the two year delay we've had because we couldn't wait any longer and have more community input. Um, I, I, I don't have that figure available for you tonight. I'm happy to provide that great. information and a follow up report to the council. That'd be great, thank you. So um, we can go ahead, and, I, I didn't expect to have support for this, but I wanna make the case that um, it's in the city's best interest to um, you know, respond to issues where there's major community concern and maybe try to find ways to work with the community rather than just saying, we got the votes and so we're gonna do this and if you don't like it, sue us and we'll complain about that too. It just isn't really a, a productive way to do policy um, and to do public service. Vice Mayor Watson. I just have a, a a brief comment. I think that, um, you know, I think we all value public process for one, and I know to a certain extent that's been a, a point of contention into what actually constitutes an adequate amount of public process. So I will just say that. Um, and then I also have heard time again that you are unable, uh, Councilmember Brown or, or even Councilmember Cummings in the past had said that you can't get things on the agenda. I just want to say, for the record, I have never been reached out to have a conversation about any of these items. And I'm happy to have those conversations if we're interested. And part of that requires us being willing to have compromise and hearing other people's um, opinions. So um, all, all due respect to your perspective, but um, I haven't been reached out to. I'm not sure, but I can't speak on behalf of my other colleagues, but um, that's, not, that's not my experience. Council Member Cummings. Um, I'll just say because, I mean, I don't want to get us off topic, but I have reached out on items that um, we wanted to put on the agenda, and we'll just, and again, because we're, um, this is, we're talking about the wharf here, but with, um, within the context of the wharf and environmental protection, part of how we ended up having to vote during oral communications on putting the item around plastic waste on the agenda is because I've reached out to council members, yourself included, and never received a response. So. That's, you know, I just want to put that out there. And anyway, um, but I think that, you know, we need to stay on topic and not turn this into a he said, she said discussion. We're talking about the wharf. So I think we should move forward with the vote tonight because we could just get into it otherwise. And it's completely unnecessary for us to have these discussions at this point in time. Okay, so we have a substitute motion. Um, Council Member Myers, your hand is still up. It, okay. We have a substitute motion. Um, I'm hearing loud and clear that there is a request for community engagement around this item. And um, it sounds like right now before us are only two options. And I'm wondering if there's another option that we could consider. I'm just throwing it out there for community engagement around this. Well, the, what is being prepared is a, a revised draft environmental impact report and a notice of prep and a, um, uh, a notice of draft environmental impact report will be made available to the public for public comment. You have the option of uh, conducting more public comment than is required by having a a discussion at multiple meetings, for instance, or by extending the public comment period, or the council can really do as much outreach as you collectively decide is warranted under the circumstances. So um, really the, the options that are available to the council are limited only by you know what the council majority believes is appropriate. 
Thank and you. Mayor and Council, if I may just chime in, um, agree with the City Attorney's comments. I would also just say that um, in addition to putting out a robust uh, notification when the circulation begins, we, we, we could also have the option of holding a more general community input meeting, uh, certainly not starting at ground zero, as the city attorney um, described uh, with a scoping meeting, but a more general community meeting that would allow those that are interested in the topic to weigh in. Um, at the end of the day, the EIR is a reflection of the master plan itself and the projects that are defined in the master plan. So if there's broader interest in wanting to revisit the master plan itself and the projects that are identified there, I think that's a different discussion. Uh, the action you have before you tonight is to move forward with uh, these um, very limited, narrow revisions, uh, as the city attorney described. But we would defer to the to the council as to whether or not there's interest in wanting to do some additional uh, community meetings as part of that work. Can I clarify with Council Member Brown? <laughs> Is your intention on the scoping meeting to revisit the master plan or just to have more general community um, engagement and input around this? Oh, my intention with the scoping meeting was to have an opportunity to talk about some of the elements of the master plan that have been narrow, rejected along narrow lines <laughs> in the environmental impact report. Um, specifically, but I mean, that could happen in a lot of different ways. So I, I don't have, but, but I do believe that we should be, and it's not really starting from scratch because we have most of that material. It's not like we have to throw it all away and go find it again, um, the saying. So, but um, when it comes to public input, I would love to see an opportunity for uh, the public to weigh in. I mean, as an alternative, I'm, I still would like to see the scoping. And so let's take the vote. But if you want to okay. talk about that at another time, I'd be happy to. Okay. So um, at this time, let's take. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to say if, if we went back to the original motion, I'm, I'm happy to add that we could add in some community exactly. meetings and maybe picture the model so people can comment down at the wharf or just ways to get the community involved in like seeing what the original plan was, what the new proposed changes are. I think that would be good. So let's take the vote on the substitute motion and then we can come um, and go from there. Council member Colin Perry Johnson? No. <coughs> Holder? No. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Meyer? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Brenner? No. And so now we uh, uh, are at the original motion. And Vice Mayor Watkins, did you have anything to? No, yeah. As the maker of the motion, I'm happy to and, and glad to incorporate your suggestion to have more additional you know, community opportunity for engagement as it relates to the, um, the reconciliation of these challenges. Uh, just for the sake of clarity, I think the m the motion was to adopt the resolution as presented. Um, and I, I'm not clear on what the friendly amendment. To, to, in, uh, to yeah. include a community meeting to over the course of additional community in addition to whatever required 45 day period, um, but to include a, an additional um, community outreach meeting um, to visit, revisit some of these items. Does that to sum up? receive additional public input on the contents of the Wharf Master Plan and the Wharf Master Plan EIR. That was your... Yeah. Council member coming. I just have a question on that because I'm wondering if there's an additional community meeting, what opportunities the community has to see the, those, um, that input kind of come back and then be able to comment. Because um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering is the idea that there will be one more meeting, whatever's, whatever information is received at the meeting, 
then goes into the planning process and then the final document is what comes before the council or is there an opportunity for people to comment on when that input is received how the council, how the city responds so they can see whether or not they're actually on board with it before it hits the council agenda because I think that's oftentimes one of the pieces is that if the community provides input they want to be able to see how that input was actually incorporated into the plan before we take action because if there's significant um, and substantial um, pushback against that then we're going to be in the same position where it comes to council and then we have a bunch of back and forth again so I'm just wondering if you know if we want to stick with one meeting or is it multiple or a additional meetings because then you know leaving it kind of more broad like one or m one or more community meetings mm -hmm. to kind of leave that flexibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what a question and maybe it's Bonnie if that if this falls in in your lap here I don't know if Bonnie you're still on um, yeah I wonder if you want to just weigh in on sort of a strategy if that's something that would come from economic development I'm assuming it would um, to, to really incorporate an opportunity for enhanced public engagement and yeah, I mean, it has been a long time since we first came forward with the work master plan. I think having a general meeting where we overview, um, I'm sure there are new community members that, uh, you know, would like to know what's in the plan, what's moving forward. I, I will say, um, you know, we do take the public comment very seriously. And um, moving forward, it, it's important to, you know, recognize that the work master plan is a guiding document. And it's also a document that we need in order to get the public works plan also going forward for us to be able to do some of the necessary, uh, you know, investments and infrastructure improvements to the war. And so it's, it's also a document that's a step in the process for being able to do much needed improvements um, and maintenance on the wharf as well. Um, so one comment I would say as a guiding document is that individual projects as they come forward are going to come forward to council. It's not once the, the project is, is approved, suddenly, you know, we go off and um, do a bunch of projects that don't come before um, the council and don't come before the community. There will be ample um, opportunities for the public to weigh in at every step along the way and in every project as it comes forward. You know, for each process and project that we have, we have community engagement and public output. So even for some of the elements uh, that potentially we could have gone forward with, you know, we're, we're waiting. We're waiting sort of for the outcome of this, for the recirculation of the EIR, for the expanded comments on the recreation, um, you know, section and chapter in, in the EIR. You know, we're, we put a hold on, you know, sort of the, uh, the, you know, new wharf sign and sort of our wayfinding just because we want to make sure we've resolved some of these outstanding issues and then we will move forward. So, um, you know, we will, you know, take and take council direction as far as what level of community engagement you want at this part, part in the process. But I just want to assure you that, you know, for each step and each project as it goes forward, there will be ample opportunity for community engagement as those go forward as well. Well, I, I appreciate those assurances. It's nice to hear that that's the strategy moving forward. And, um, and I'm happy to, you know, incorporate if we want for the purposes of what we're having before us today, you know, two additional community meetings and then ideally whatever additional meetings will come from that um, moving forward uh, if that feels adequate. While the recirculation is important, that's what it's going away. <laughs> Do you have something, Tony? <laughs> I just want to be clear that for the, for the, uh, Revised DIR, there is a statutory process that we are required to follow. And so I would assume, I mean, I, it's fine if community meetings happen while that 45 day comment period is, um, it, it is, is running. Um, after that, it will be probably several months before the final EIR comes back to the council for considering certification. So, so that, that will be the process because we have to, we have to receive, digest the public comments, respond to them, and make any tweaks or adjustments we feel are necessary to address um, valid public comment. And so that's why that 45 window right. is important. So yeah, yeah, so with that added. Thank you. OK, so for clarity, the, the motion has an amendment, a friendly amendment to add one or more 
um, additional community meetings to receive input, <coughs> to receive public comment and follow up as uh, Council Member Cummings um, suggested. Okay. So that was Council Member Cummings' friendly amendment that was accepted? Is that what you said? Um, at, at originally, it was Golder. <laughs> Council Member Golder made the friendly amendment. I think we've all massaged it, so to speak. Um, and so now we can see if the friendly amendment has been accepted by the maker of the motion. Accepted. Okay. And the seconder yeah. was uh, Council Member Golder. No, I just like to see the language, if possible. Yeah, I think she's typing yeah. it. Thank you. Can you show the language? Thank you. Up on that motion. Uh, Council Member Oh, wait. Can you show the language of the oh. motion, please? Thank you. Sorry about that confusion. Right. Multitasking. <laughs> Forty-five day window, while the recirculation is going on. That was forty-five day comment period. During the circulation of the EIR. For the forty-five day comment period, during the circulation of the EIR. Forty-five day comment period. <coughs> related to the areas of outlined in the resolution. We'll see if it, I'm a visual person. Tony, consistent with the revisions to the resolution, um, we should delete the words all but the uncontested portion of. <coughs> You could delete the related to and just leave it at after the 45 day comment period. Yep. Council member Cummings. Yeah, so I'll just say that, um, you know, while we weren't able to meet the needs of what the community had brought to us today, and um, although we tried to, you know, put that action into motion, um, my hope is that we will be able to have meaningful community engagement and meetings with the community because um, if not, I do have some serious concerns about this, um, that you know, we'll be in a similar situation where we'll be getting sued again if we're not able to address all the issues that are being raised by the community. And so um, I'm gonna support this you know, direction um, with the hopes that we will be able to actually um, get the concerns of the community addressed um, and, uh, and yep, so that's my hope that we can actually have meaningful, um, engagement with the people who are most concerned with this project because, um, they obviously didn't feel like they were heard before. It's now delayed this by two years. And if we don't try to hear them again, it might be delayed for another two years. And that's, I think what we're all trying to let to stop is that, um, we can actually hear from people who are who feel that you know they are not being heard and really support um, uh, what the community wants to see come forward. Okay. Um, and so, what well, we've already completed, um, yeah. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council. So, so the, um, the comment was that um, the input uh, would best be utilized um, or, or, or occur prior to the 45-day circulation period, which, yes, but I'm not sure that's where Council's at. What does that look like? When does that 45-day period start? Well, I'm not sure that uh, the 45-day period starts when the city issues a notice of release of the draft environmental impact report. I think what um, Ms. Greensight's comment is directed to is the desire to really reopen the discussion of the elements of the project itself. and. That's a policy decision for the city council, but what is in process right now is a revision to the EIR specifically to address the issues identified by the court in the litigation. So unless the council's interested in reopening the discussion of the elements of the wharf master plan itself, then I, I don't think that would be a productive uh, course of action. Um, and, and so, uh, again, it's whatever the council prefers, but uh, I don't see that as being a productive community conversation unless the council's interested in, again, reopening the entire uh, process from, from basically the beginning. Yeah, and it sounds like we had that discussion, Council Member Cummings. Oh. Well, I was gonna ask, um, you know, what harm is there in having those community meetings before the 45-day period? Because there's obviously, you know, some community concern uh, having staff, and if there's council members who are interested, attend those meetings and hear, you know, from the community itself on those topics. Maybe that will help with moving into this, you know, 45-day scoping period. Or you know. so the the language of the um, timing in the uh, friendly amendment, Bonnie, um, is currently before the 40 or. Uh, during okay. the 45 day, within the 45 day. So it sounds like uh, Council Member Brown, you're suggesting before the 45 day period. Um, yeah. And is that possible? Um, and is there a time, are you, is there a restricted time frame that you have to issue out and then the 45 day clock begins? Do we have time to schedule these meetings before the 45 day? I'm not specifically aware of the timing of the release of the draft environmental impact report. Okay. I guess my comment was directed at the fact that I'm not quite sure um, how useful a discussion before the release of the revised uh, draft impact report is, is made public unless the council wants to start the discussion over you know, from the beginning and reopen the content of the wharf master plan itself. Yeah, Mayor and Council, if I could chime in, I, I think the short answer to that is yes, it's possible to hold meetings in advance of the circulation. I think the question, the policy question really boils down to whether or not the master plan still reflects the direction the council is wanting to go. Uh, because by extension, that will have influence over the EIR itself. If there's interest in holding community meetings to reopen the discussion of the master plan that's already been adopted by council, uh, you all could certainly direct that. Uh, we could go away, hold some additional community meetings uh, and, and restart the, the discussion with the community regarding the projects that are identified. If that's not of interest to the council, I would agree with the city attorney that hol holding meetings in advance of the circulation of the EIR could give the impression that the council is interested and taking a second look at the projects uh, currently in the master plan. So I, I think that is the mm -hmm. that is the decision it really boils down to for the council. Okay. Council member coming. I have a follow up question to that um, because I think that and council member Golda brought it up as well that there you know are some aspects that people in the community aren't very happy with in terms of that plan. And I guess my question is, for example, if the landmark building were to be revisited and we were to have a discussion to remove that from the plan, would that trigger starting completely over with a new EIR? Or are there aspects of the plan that we could address um, prior to that, to the 45-day you know, uh, release of a draft EIR? 
Yes, the council, um, as, as was discussed the last time the EIR was presented to you for certification, has the option of omitting elements of the Wharf Master Plan when it considers certification of the revised EIR. Um, that was requested by certain members, members of the public uh, the last time around, and the council declined to do that. But that option is still available to the council when it comes before you okay. for final certification. I guess the question is, would it make, it seems like it would make sense for us to have those discussions before the final certification, like well in advance. And so if we can. Well, I mean, of necessity, it will have to be before the final certification. The question is, how far in advance do you think that's you know, necessary? And um, also, um, you know, some aspects of the plan that were criticized by members of the public were not found defective, or were not found defective in the EIR. So um, you're really talking about two things here. One is a policy decision about what's in, in the best interests of the community with respect to the elements of the plan. And the other is uh, the adequacy in, of the environmental review. I, I'm more focused on the environmental review, but certainly the council can have a broader policy discussion because the plan will come back to you for approval again, since the resolution that you're considering adopting rescinds your approval of the plan. Thank you. Okay. Those were great clarifications. And so I guess um, I'd like to make a amendment to the main motion. <laughs> Clarify, did you change that to before 45, the 45-day 45 comment period? No, no, I left it as. And I see um, Council Member Myers, I also see your hand up. So um, go ahead, Council Member. So I was going to actually um, move that we agendize the discussion of the elements of the Wharf Master Plan for future community conversation. Because that's, that's what it sounds like people want to have an option to, to have discussed and they want the, the council to weigh in on. So if it sounds like that's something that we can do, it's not going to affect the 45 um, day period for the notice of the release of the draft DIR, where there will also be additional comments, then I would like to add that as an amendment that we have that opportunity for um, the public to weigh in prior to the 45 day um, notice of release of the draft DIR. Could you restate that sure. in a more concise way so that we can get it clear for the record? Sure. Um, move that we agendize a discussion about the elements of the Wharf Master Plan prior to the 45-day notice of release of the draft EIR. I'll second that. Is this a substitute motion? Nope, I'm it's an amendment. Cute. No. I believe it would be uh, an addition in to addition. the existing motion language if it's accepted by the council. And I'll just say that, um, you know, in the spirit of trying to build consensus on something that's of great concern to the community, this seems like something that we could add to this process. That and it, Because I think that the additions of the other opportunities to have people weigh in are good um, for us to, to have um, in this process, and I'm supportive of that, but it sounds like what the community and some of the members who were involved in this lawsuit want, want to see is an opportunity for us to discuss some of the elements that have been controversial and an opportunity to see whether or not those elements, um, whether, whether there's interest in addressing some of those elements as well. Um, I'm not sure what, and maybe you could, we could have someone weigh in on what the full timeline of this process will be, but um, you know, this could be something that new council members want to weigh in on if we have a you know, new mayor. Um, th this may be something that they would want to take, you know, up for consideration and to, to see if we can actually come to some kind of consensus so we're not in lawsuits all the time over this issue. And so um, I think that that could be a, a good compromise to kind of get us moving forward and, and, and some kind of agreement with how we can, can move this item forward. Okay, so for clarity, are you adding this in addition to the one or more additional community meetings now, and you're adding an agendized item mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Before that 45 day period. Okay. Second. And so we have a first and a second amendment. So 
at this point, the council can vote on whether to accept the amendment to the motion proposed by council member Cummings and seconded by council member Brown. Um, and I see that um, council member Myers, you had your hand up. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of, I'm trying to understand what we're doing. Um, <laughs> I'm getting confused because we're now, we've gone from a resolution that was basically, you know, a resolution that outlined based on the court's decisions, what needed to be remedied in the environmental impact report, which is a necessary item for pretty much any big capital project. So we've gone from basically CEQA, which is a environmental review. And now we're, now we're at opening up the wharf master plan and seeing if we're going to redo that or at least collect public comment on it. So I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with where we are now um, because I think there's, from my understanding, there's only two people in the city council chamber and there's a lot of businesses and a lot of people out there on that wharf. I don't think any of them have any clue that we are gonna shift the wharf master plan process again. So I'm, I'm just confused because it was a consent item and I feel like we are in a place where really we, we're talking about community involvement. We're now asking to open up one of the major infrastructure master plans we've done in the last 25 years in the city of Santa Cruz because, you know, some, some people just don't like anything that gets done in Santa Cruz. So, you know, I'm, I'm just feeling like we're really drifting into a place that is really inappropriate in terms of public uh, transparency and communication and community output. And I see my colleagues' hands, but I'm going to just put out my opinion because we all get to do that. And I understand that you're very frustrated with me right now for speaking, but I feel like we've just gone down a road that, um, you know, if I was a business owner on the wharf right now, I'd be freaking out. And, you know, anything and everything in that wharf master plan is up for individual approvals through the entire process of doing anything on the wharf. If someone proposes the landmark building and the city council that's sitting there at that point in time doesn't like it and votes it down, then there's no landmark building. But to try to, to say that we're going to rescope our wharf master plan and try to get community involvement into an infrastructure effort that was ongoing for four years, it's just, it's just not appropriate. We've spent a lot of money doing the plan. We've spent money on the EIR and I think we're down, we're, we're in a place that's very uncomfortable for me. So it's disappointing that this is this item on consent is being used to rescope the wharf master plan. So that's that's my comment. I hope we can get on to our labor item because that is very important for us to solve as a community tonight. An hour and 45 minutes into this item. Thank you. I have um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, Council Member Cummings, and Council Member Brown. I have had the opportunity to speak to um, some business um, owners and, and people who are working in those spaces. Um, and to the point that Council Member Myers made and that Bonnie Lipscomb made earlier, they are very frustrated and it is impacting them. Um, so to move backwards a year, um, is I don't think is the right decision for our community and for those businesses. And I just want to comment that this makeup of this council has been for two years. It hasn't always been a 5-2. There were different council members at different times. So um, to, I agree that to use a consent item um, and take up two hours when we have very serious business to get to, it's, it's very frustrating. I'm ready to take a vote, I've sat quietly, I've taken it all in, um, really trying to weigh which direction. Um, and I think that the original uh, motion that was then friendly amended is a great direction to go. So I'm not calling to question because I don't want to cut my colleagues off, but I, I am really ready to take a vote. Thank you. Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. You know, I'll just say briefly that um, 
you know, we're not talking about rescoping the entire master, wharf master plan. We're not, we're not talking about taking a year. Um, and, you know, I think what we're trying to do is address the concerns coming from the community. We have before us what the courts want, but then we also have what the community wants. And if, you know, and as a, again, I was one of the council members who um, worked to see how we can build consensus, and I went with um, the majority at the time to move forward with the Wharf, ma the Wharf Master Plan. And two years later, we're being, we, we were sued, and they prevailed over the city. And what I'm hoping for is that we don't find ourselves in that situation again. And what people are asking for is an opportunity to have a discussion about some of the elements within that plan. That's what I've you know, proposed as an amendment. Um, that would not you know, start this whole process over again. The city, man, the city attorney did emphasize that there, there are elements that the, community, that the city council wants to remove. They can remove those. And that's not going to trigger an entirely new environmental review process. But what it is going to do is provide the community with an opportunity to be heard and for that to be considered by the city council. And so we are not talking about trying to delay this. We're actually ta talking about trying to get the community input that was ignored previously, which has resulted in a two-year delay and a loss of city funds to have to address this. So those are all my comments. And yeah. Thank you. <coughs> You're done? Okay. So we have a motion, and we have a friendly motion. Uh, so the friendly amendment is gone? No, it's so okay. um, she's what's working back, she's what's on the floor right yes. now is Council Member Cummings' proposed amendment to the motion. The council needs to vote on whether to accept the amendment. If you do, then you will vote on the motion with the amendment included. Okay, thank you. So we are taking a vote on the amendment proposed by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown. Mayor, could we? I'm, I'm unclear what the amendment is. Sorry. Oh, to uh, 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 add an agenda, agendize um, a discussion on this. Thank you. Yeah. And if I have one more comment. Part of why we want to agenda the discussion is exactly to Council Member Myers' point. We're trying to not take action tonight on any changes to the Wharf Master Plan. It's to put this item on the agenda for discussion. So that would allow people in the Wharf to weigh in, the community to weigh in, for us to hear what the community concerns are and take action. So this is actually in the spirit of what of what Council Member Myers' points were around, you know, trying to actually have some the opportunity for the community to provide input. Does that look accurate? That looks accurate. And wait, agendas. Agendas. I, I could suggest a minor. Revision. Can we just before we do the revision, does that look accurate to what you said More originally? Or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think what Councilmember Cummings intended was for that uh, discussion to occur prior to the release of the draft environmental impact report for the 45 day review mm -hmm. period. Prior to the release of rather yeah. than completion of. Can you, Tony, can you say that one more time? Completion. Uh, after the word prior to the release of the draft EIR for the 45 day review period. Draft EIR. For the, <coughs> got it. 45 day review period. Thank you. And then can I make one last comment? I'll just, I just want to say because, you know, we don't have, like, the mayor is the only person who has the, the power to put items on the agenda. And so having served as mayor, I do know that um, there are times when you need to evaluate what's going to be controversial and what's going to likely get the full consideration of the council. So, you know, this notion that we pulled this item and now we're dragging this out, it's because people have, wait, have, have concerns about it and they're trying to weigh in and have their voices heard. This is not something that, it, you know, it's going to have unanimous support within the community. 
And so pulling this from consent was an opportunity for us to have this discussion and try to see how we can, you know, work towards a pathway forward that is that is you know mutual, and um, and so I just want to put that out there because um, it's for the public to know, um, you know, we don't know what's going on the agenda until the Thursday before as council members, and so we have no way to weigh in on whether something should go on some consent or not. Those are all my comments. Thank you. Um, it sounds like we are ready. We have a motion, um, an amendment to the motion to vote on the amendment. And um, thank you, everyone, for the discussion. It was, um, I think, very helpful for us all in clarifying. And um, it's always important to have uh, opportunity for our public to express their concerns in this way. So. Um, if we could ask for a roll call vote on the amendment, please. Council members Kalantari Johnson? No. Boulder? No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Um, Meyer? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Bruder? Aye. I think um, I just want to comment that, um, you know, this after receiving clarity on rescoping versus community meetings versus agendizing this item, that there is a, a big difference in the timing and the cost to us. So I think um, what's proposed here, I do support, and um, I think it would um, be helpful in this context. So I am an I. But the motion does not pass. Um, so <laughs> that's uh, uh, four no's, three yes. OK, so that brings us back to the original motion with the friendly amendment. And we will take a roll call vote on that, please. Council member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. And for the record, um, we tried to provide as much you know, opportunity for community engagement. And um, my hope is that the people will have an opportunity to weigh in during this 45 day period before the notice of release of the draft EIR. Uh, Councilmember Brown? Aye. Councilmember Myers? The this is the original motion, right, with the, yeah, aye. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Me, aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. And um, I'm glad we're able to have one or more additional community meetings on this. Um, so thank you, everyone. Okay, that concludes item number 15 on our consent agenda. I am pulling up my notes. At this time, we will adjourn back into closed session and um, the public portion of this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Will there be a report out afterwards or how does this work there there would be a report out if the council takes any action